The Power of Positive Thinking was first published in 1952. Over the years, it has continued to be an inspirational bestseller. Through its vivid demonstrations of the power of faith, it has helped millions of men and women find a workable method for achieving happiness and success. And now, here is Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Altogether, too many people are defeated by the everyday problems of life. They go struggling through their days with a sense of dull resentment at what they consider the bad breaks life has dealt them. In a sense, there may be such a thing as the breaks in life, but there is also a spirit and a method by which we can control and even determine those breaks. It's a pity that people let themselves be defeated by the problems, cares, and difficulties of human existence, and it is also quite unnecessary. At the time I wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, it never occurred to me that several million copies would be sold. I am grateful for this, not because so many books were sold, but because I've been privileged to suggest a simple, workable philosophy of living to so many people. The dynamic laws which my book teaches were learned the hard way by trial and error in my personal search for a way of life. I found in these laws solutions to my problems, and as I realized their power, I wanted to share my experience with others. I wrote the book out of deep concern for the pain and struggle of human existence. The examples and techniques I present show that you don't have to be defeated by anything, that you can have peace of mind, improved health, and a never-ceasing flow of energy. Positive thinking is both a philosophy and an expression of faith. It teaches the cultivation of peace of mind, not as an escape from problems, but as a practical approach to creating a life that is personally and socially worthwhile. The way of life to which this book is a witness is very wonderful. Although the road can be a difficult one, it is also full of hope and victory and even joy. It is my sincere hope that you will take these principles to heart and discover for yourself how the power of positive thinking can truly change your life. The greatest secret for eliminating the inferiority complex, which is another term for profound self-doubt, is to fill your mind to the overflowing with faith. Develop a tremendous faith in God, and that will give you a humble yet soundly realistic faith in yourself. And how do you acquire this dynamic faith? Well, the answer begins with the study of the scriptures and the use of prayer, lots of prayer. The scriptures say, according to your faith, be it unto you. The bigger your problem, the bigger your prayer should be. Drive your prayers deep into your doubts, into your fears and insecurities. Pray deep, big prayers that have plenty of strength and you will come up with a powerful and vital faith. It is also helpful to go to a competent spiritual advisor, a minister, a priest, or a rabbi for instruction. The ability to make faith work for you is a skill, and like any skill, it must be studied and practiced to be perfected. One of the most powerful cures for self-doubt is the thought that you are not alone in this world, that Almighty God is actually with you, helping you, that He will be your companion, that He will stand by you, support you, and see you through every adversity. To practice this belief, simply affirm, God is with me, God is helping me, 
God is guiding me. Spend several minutes each day visualizing God's presence. Then practice believing that affirmation. Go about your business on the assumption that what you have affirmed and visualized is absolutely true. The release of power and confidence which this procedure stimulates will astonish you. Along with prayer and study of the scriptures, another very effective way to build self-confidence is by suggesting confidence concepts to yourself. If your mind is obsessed by thoughts of insecurity and inadequacy, that is, of course, because such thoughts have dominated your thinking over a long period of time. You must give your mind a different and more positive thought pattern, and that requires discipline. In the busy activities of daily existence, the repetition of positive ideas can help re-educate the mind and make of it a power-producing plant. It is possible, even in the midst of your daily work, to drive confident thoughts into your consciousness. Let me tell you about a method one man discovered. This man once went around with the feeling that something terrible was going to happen to him, and it made his life miserable, of course. His mind was saturated with a sense of inferiority. This mental state was reflected in his business, which was doing poorly. But then he hit upon a plan which knocked all those thoughts out of his mind, a plan which allowed him to live with a sense of confidence in himself and in life. I'm a traveling salesman, he explained, and I drive around all day calling on my customers. I discovered that while a person drives, he or she thinks all kinds of thoughts. If the pattern of thought is negative, one will think many negative thoughts during the day, and that's the way I used to be, he said. I used to drive around all day between calls with my mind full of fear and defeat. And that is one of the reasons my work was going so poorly. Then he showed me his plan. In his glove compartment, he kept a pack of small cards. He chose one and clipped it on the instrument panel of his car. It read, If you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. He pulled out another, which read, If God be for us, who can be against us? He told me that as he drove around, he memorized these thoughts. He said, I've learned to think differently as a result of this practice. The old insecurities that used to haunt me are just about all gone now. And instead of thinking thoughts of defeat and despair, I think thoughts of faith and courage. It is really wonderful the way this method has changed me. It has helped my business, too. For how can you expect to make a sale if you approach a customer thinking you are going to fail? This plan is a very wise one. By filling his mind with affirmations of the presence, support, and help of God, this man actually changed his thought processes. He put an end to the domination of his long-held sense of insecurity. His potential powers were set free. You see, feelings of confidence depend upon the type of thoughts that habitually occupy your mind. If constantly you fix your attention upon dire events that might happen, the result is that you will constantly feel insecure. And what is even more serious is the tendency to create, by the power of thought, the very condition you fear. But when you fill your mind with thoughts of faith, confidence, and security, you force out all thoughts of doubt and weakness. One man I know used a process I'll repeat often in this tape. 
He went through the Bible and underlined every passage about courage and confidence that he could find. He then committed these lines to memory, in effect, cramming his mind full of the healthiest, happiest, and most powerful thoughts in the world. After a few weeks, the change in him was little short of remarkable. From almost complete defeat, he became an inspiring and confident personality. He now radiates courage and magnetism. He regained confidence in himself and in his own powers by a simple process of thought conditioning. Ralph Waldo Emerson declared a tremendous truth when he said, they conquer who believe they can. He also said, do the thing you fear and the death of fear is certain. Practice confidence and faith and your fears and insecurities will soon have no power over you at all. The blows of life, from daily difficulties to large-scale problems, tend to dissipate energy and leave you spent and discouraged. In such a condition, your true inner power is often obscured, and it becomes easy to yield to setbacks by feeling hopeless. When you find yourself in such a state, it is important to reappraise your assets. A reasonable self-evaluation will convince you that things are not as hopeless as you think they are. For example, a man of 52 consulted me. He was in despair. He told me that everything he had built up over his lifetime had been swept away. Everything, I asked sympathetically. Everything, he repeated. I have nothing left at all. Everything is gone. There is no hope, and I am too old to start all over again. And he said, sadly, I have lost all faith. Naturally, I felt sympathetic toward him, but it was evident that his chief trouble came from the dark shadows of hopelessness in his thinking. These shadows had entered into his mind and had distorted his outlook. His true powers had retreated behind this twisted thinking, leaving him without any force. So I said, suppose we take a piece of paper and on it list the values you have left. Ah, there's no use, he sighed. I haven't a single thing left. Well, I said, let's just see anyway. Now, is your wife still with you? Why, yes, of course. And she's wonderful, he added. We've been married for 30 years. She would never leave me, no matter how badly things were. All right, I said, let's put that down. Wife still with me. And how about your children? He said, actually... They've all told me that they love me and will stand by me. They are wonderful. Well, then, that is number two. Children love you and will stand by you. Have you any friends? Yes, he said, I really have some fine friends who've offered to help. They've been very generous, but what can they do? So I wrote down number three. Fine friends who hold you in esteem. How about your integrity, your standing in the community? Oh, okay. I've always tried to do the right thing. Well, let's put that down as number four. Integrity, good standing. How about your health? My health is okay, I'm glad to say. Number five, then, is good physical health. How about the United States? Do you still think it's the best place to do business and is the land of opportunity? Well, you and me both agree that it's the only country in the world we'd want to live in, he replied. Well, then that's number six. You live in the USA, land of opportunity, and you're glad to be here. Then I asked, how about your religious faith? Do you believe in God and that God will help you? 
Yes, he admitted, I don't think I could have gotten through this at all if I hadn't had some help from God. At this point, I read him the assets we'd listed. Then I shoved it across the table to him. Take a look at that, I said. You've got quite a total of assets there. I thought you told me everything had been swept away. He grinned sheepishly. I guess I never thought of the situation that way. Perhaps things aren't so bad at that, he said pensively. Maybe I can start all over again. If I could just get some confidence, if I could just get the feel of some power inside me. Well, in time, he did get that feeling, and he did start all over again. But he did so only when he changed his viewpoint, his mental attitude. It was faith that swept away his doubts and gave him more than enough power to overcome all of his difficulties. And I must admit, he had plenty at the time. This incident illustrates a profound truth, that attitudes are more important than facts. Anything facing us, however difficult, is not as important as our attitude towards it. The secret to rising above most difficulties is simply to gain a more balanced view, with a slant that is weighted a bit on the positive side. So if you feel you are defeated, and have lost confidence in your ability to win, tell you what you do. Take a piece of paper and make a list, not of the factors that are against you, but of those that are for you. If anyone thinks constantly of opposing forces, those forces will get built up until they assume a formidable strength, which they actually don't possess. But if you mentally visualize and affirm and reaffirm your assets, you will rise out of even the most awesome difficulty. Your inner powers will reassert themselves and with the help of God, lift you from defeat to victory. To help you start building up your self-confidence, here are seven suggestions. One, create a mental picture of yourself as a success. Hold on to this picture tenaciously. Never permit it to fade. Since your mind tries to complete what it pictures, always picture success, no matter how badly things seem to be going at the moment. Whenever a negative thought about your personal power comes to mind, deliberately voice a positive thought to cancel it out. Two, don't build up obstacles in your imagination. Minimize them instead. Problems should be seen for what they are and never inflated by fearful thoughts. Three, don't be awestruck by other people or try to copy them. Remember that most people, despite a confident appearance, are often as scared and as doubtful of themselves as you are. Four, Get a competent counselor to help you understand the origin of your feelings of inferiority and self-doubt. These feelings often begin in childhood. Self-knowledge leads to a cure. Five, each day practice the following affirmation. Repeat it out loud if possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's another dynamic affirmation. If God be for us, who can be against us? Six, make what you think is a true estimate of your own ability, then raise it 10%. Don't become egotistical, but develop a wholesome self-respect. Believe in your own God-released powers. Seven, put yourself in God's hands. To do that, simply state, I am in God's hands. Then believe you are now receiving all the power you need Affirm that the kingdom of God is within you in the form of adequate power to meet all of life's demands. Remind yourself that God is with you and there is nothing that can defeat him. Now, Dr. Peel illustrates an important fact about human nature. You can think your way to failure and misery, but you can also think your way to success and happiness because thoughts are real and dynamic 
Learning to harness their power is a crucial step in creating a life of your own choosing. Some years ago, I was working with a group of people to establish a nonprofit inspirational magazine. At one point, our endeavor was faced with severe financial problems. In other words, it was almost broke. And when it seemed almost impossible to keep going, I called a meeting. I invited a woman who had once contributed a nice sum to this magazine, hoping that lightning might strike twice in the same place. But this time, she said she would give us something of greater value than money. This rather surprised us, for under the circumstances, we couldn't think of anything more valuable than money. When she told us she was going to give us a creative idea, we didn't jump with enthusiasm. All we could think was, how can we pay our bills with an idea? But, as it turned out, an idea is precisely what helped us pay our bills. Every achievement in the world was first initiated as a creative idea. First the idea, then faith in it, then the means of implementing the idea. That is the way success proceeds. This woman continued, now she said, here is the idea. What is your present trouble? Your trouble is that you lack everything, don't you? You lack money, you lack subscribers, you lack equipment, you lack courage. And why do you suppose you lack everything? Why, simply because you're only thinking about what you lack. You are constantly thinking lack thoughts, and you have thereby created a condition of lack. She told us if you constantly think about what you don't have, you keep creating the conditions that keep you in this state. By emphasizing only what you lack, you frustrated the creative forces that can get this project really rolling. She said, from the standpoint of doing a lot, you've been working very hard, but you fail to do the one all-important thing that will lend power to all your other efforts. You have not employed positive thinking. To correct the situation, she advised us to reverse the mental process and begin to think, instead of lack, to think prosperity, achievement, and success. She told us, don't hold on to the mental pictures of difficulties and failures. Lift your mind above them and visualize instead powers and achievements. When you elevate your thoughts into the realm of attainment, you look down on your problems rather than up at them, and thus you get a more encouraging viewpoint. Always come up over your problems mentally. Never approach a problem from below. Wise advice, if you ask me. Anyway, it worked. She told us the key was to visualize the solution to our problem. Suddenly she asked, how many subscribers do you need to keep this magazine going? At that time, we had only 40,000 paid subscribers. I thought quickly and said, 100,000 would do it. All right, she said confidently, that's not too hard. In fact, that's easy. All you need to do is to visualize 100,000 people being creatively helped by this magazine, and you will have them. In fact, the minute you can see them, image and visualize them in your mind, you already have them. She turned to me and she said, can you see 100,000 subscribers at this minute? Look out there. Look ahead of you in your mind. Can you see them? Well, I wasn't convinced, and I said rather doubtfully, well, maybe so, but they seem pretty dim to me. 
She seemed a little disappointed in me as she repeated, Use your imagination to visualize those 100,000 subscribers. I guess my imagination wasn't working too well because all I could see was the insufficient but actual 40,000 paid subscribers. Then she turned to someone else. Can you see 100,000 subscribers, she asked. I rather doubted that he would either, but this fellow does have a creative imagination, and I noticed by the fascinated look on his face that she had him. He was gazing straight ahead with a look of wonder when she asked again, do you see the 100,000 subscribers? Yes, he cried eagerly. Yes, I do see them. Electrified, I demanded, where are they? Point them out to me. Then I, too, began to visualize them. Now, continued the woman, let us say a prayer and together thank God for giving us 100,000 paid subscribers. Frankly, I thought that was pushing the Lord rather hard. But then I remembered a verse in the scripture where it says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive them. That means that when you pray for something, visualize what you pray for, believe that if it is God's will and is not selfishly sought after, then it is at that moment given to you. If you have difficulty believing this story, let me assure you that from that moment on, our magazine enterprise never lacked for anything. I tell you this because I was awed by the experience, realizing that I had stumbled upon a tremendous formula for personal victory. I call it the power of positive imaging. I decided to apply it from then on to my own problems, and whenever I've done so, I've had marvelous results. But whenever I fail to do so, I've missed great opportunities. One of the most important insights about the human race was expressed by the famous psychologist William James. He said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. In other words, as you think, so shall you be. If you want to improve your situation, get rid of all your old, tired, worn out thoughts. Fill your mind with fresh, new, creative thoughts of faith, love, and goodness. By this process, you can actually remake your life. One business executive I know is the type of person who is never defeated. No problem, no setback, no obstacle ever gets him down. He simply attacks each difficulty with an optimistic attitude and a ready confidence that it will work out all right. And in some strange way, it always does. He seems to have a magic touch in life, a touch that never fails. One day he told me his secret. I was visiting his plant, a modern structure equipped with the latest machinery, using the most up-to-date production methods. It was a factory of outstanding efficiency. When we entered his office, which was decorated in a very modern style, I was quite surprised to find on his highly polished mahogany desk a battered old copy of the Bible. That book, he replied, pointing to the Bible, is actually the most up-to-date thing in this plant. Equipment wears out and furnishing styles change. But that book is so far ahead of us that it never gets out of date. When I went to college, my good Christian mother gave me that Bible saying, if I would read and practice its teachings, I would learn how to get through life successfully. I took the book, he said, just to humor her, but for years, I practically never looked at it. I thought I didn't need it. Well, how stupid can you get? And I got my life in a terrible mess. 
He continued his story saying, everything went wrong primarily because I was wrong. I was thinking wrong and acting wrong. I succeeded at practically nothing, failed at almost everything. Now I realize that my principal trouble was wrong thinking. I was negative, resentful, cocky, opinionated. Nobody could tell me anything. I was filled with gripes at everybody. Little wonder I had no friends. Well, he said, one night I was going through some papers and I came across the long forgotten Bible. It brought up old memories and I started to read it aimlessly. It's strange how things happen, how in just a moment of time, everything can become different. As I read, a sentence leaped up at me, a sentence that changed my life. And when I say changed, I mean changed. Here is the sentence this man quoted. The Lord is the strength of my life. In this will I be confident. I don't know why that one line affected me so, he went on, but it did. I now know that I was weak and a failure because I had no faith, no confidence. But when I read that line, something clicked in my mind. I guess I had what they call a spiritual experience. I decided to put my faith in God thereafter and sincerely try to do my best following the principles laid down in the Bible. As I did so, I began to get hold of a new set of positive thoughts. In time, my old ways of thinking faded away, and these new thoughts took over and remade me. This incident illustrates an important fact about human nature, which is you can think your way to failure and misery, but you can also think your way to success and happiness. The world in which you live is not primarily determined by outward conditions and circumstances, but by the thoughts that habitually occupy your mind. As Emerson declared, a man is what he thinks about all day long. It has been said that thoughts are things, that they actually possess dynamic power. You can actually think yourself into or out of situations. You can make yourself ill with your thoughts, and by the same token, you can make yourself well by the use of a healing type of thought. Think positively, and you create an atmosphere that nurtures the development of positive outcomes. At this very moment, potential positive ideas are working in your mind. By releasing and developing these ideas, you can solve your financial problem or your business situation or anything. The practical use of your creative, positive thought pattern can remake your life and you along with it. There was a time when I acquiesced in the silly idea that there is no relationship between faith and prosperity, that when one talked about religion, it should never be related to achievement, that it dealt only with ethics and morals or social values. But I came to realize that such a viewpoint limits the power of God and the development of the individual. Christianity teaches that there is a tremendous power in the universe and that this power can and does dwell in personality. It is a power that can blast out all defeat and lift a person above every difficult situation. We have seen the demonstration of atomic energy we know that astonishing and enormous energy exists in the universe. The same force of energy resides in the human mind. Nothing on earth is greater than the human mind in potential power. 
the average individual is capable of much greater achievement than he or she has ever realized. When you actually learn to release your potential power, you will discover that your mind contains ideas of such innovative and creative value that you need not lack for anything anymore. By the full and proper use of your power, stimulated by God's power, you can make just about anything of your life, anything you will pray for and work for. So, tell you what, look deeply into your mind. Amazing wonders are there. Here is a method that will help creative thoughts to flow freely from your mind. First, quiet your mind so that inspirations may rise from its depths. Believe that God is now, this minute, helping you. Form a picture in your mind of your life as it should be. Believe in it. Pray about it. Work at it. Never give up on it. Organize your life on a spiritual basis so that God's mighty principles really go to work within you. You will find that here is one of the greatest laws in the universe, and it's stated in three words, believe and succeed. In the final analysis, the basic reason a person fails to live a creative and successful life is because of error within himself. His thinking is wrong. When the 23rd Psalm says, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness, it not only means that a person is to depart from evil and do good, but that he is to change his thinking from wrong to right, from error to truth. The great secret of successful living is to reduce the amount of error in oneself and increase the amount of truth. It's just that simple. A constant stream of positive God-guided thoughts creatively affects the circumstances of life. For inner truth always guides you toward the right path and therefore leads to the right results. Are some practical suggestions for changing your mental attitude from negative to positive. Such a change will release the kinds of thoughts that can help you make creative changes in your circumstances. 1. For the next 24 hours, deliberately speak hopefully about everything – your job, your health, your future. Go out of your way to put optimism in everything you say. 2. After speaking hopefully for 24 hours, Continue the practice for one week. Then you can permit yourself to be realistic for a day or two. You'll discover that what you meant by realistic a week ago was actually pessimistic, and what you now mean by realistic is something entirely different. It is the dawning of the positive outlook. When most people say they're being realistic, they delude themselves. They are simply being negative. Three. Feed your mind even as you feed your body. A healthy mind requires nourishing, wholesome thoughts. Start at the beginning of the New Testament and underline every sentence about faith. Continue doing this until you've marked every passage in the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 4. Commit all of those passages to memory. Learn one each day until you can recite the entire list from memory. This will take time, but remember, you've spent much more time being a negative thinker. Unlearning a negative pattern requires time and effort. 5. 
Make a list of your friends who are positive thinkers and deliberately cultivate their company. Don't abandon your negative friends, but get closer to those with a positive point of view until you've absorbed their spirit. 6. Try to avoid arguments, but whenever a negative attitude is expressed, counter with a positive and optimistic opinion. 7. Pray a great deal and always let your prayers take the form of thanksgiving. Assume that God is giving you great and wonderful things, for if you think He is, He surely is. God will not give you any greater blessing than you can believe in. Remember, according to your faith, be it unto you. We've all had problems from time to time, and for some of us they've been so large we're tempted to think that no power on earth can save us. You'll see that some people don't look at things that way. They've found there is an answer to every problem. There is a power that can help. Prayer. Personally, I believe that prayer is a sending out of vibrations from one person to another and to God. The entire universe is in vibration. The air is filled with vibration. There are vibrations even in the molecules of a table. The reaction between two human beings is in vibration. When you send out a prayer for another person, you are activating the forces of a spiritual universe. You transmit from yourself to another person a sense of love, helpfulness, support, a sympathetic, powerful understanding. In this process, you awaken the creative vibrations through which God brings to pass the good things you pray for. Prayer power is a manifestation of energy. Just as there are scientific techniques for the release of atomic energy, so are there procedures for the release of spiritual energy through prayer. Tension and other related troubles can result from a lack of inner harmony, but it is remarkable how prayer restores the harmonious functioning of body and soul. It appears that even the aging process can be held in check by prayer. You need not lose your vital energy or become weak and listless just because of accumulating years. Nor is it necessary for your spirit to sag or become dull. Prayer can actually freshen you up every evening and send you out renewed every morning. And of course, if prayer is driven deeply into your subconscious, you can receive guidance in problems. If you haven't experienced this power, perhaps you need to learn some new techniques of prayer. It is important to realize that you're dealing with the most tremendous power in the world when you pray. The key is to find the process that most effectively opens your mind to God. Any method which stimulates the flow of God's power into your mind is highly creative. If you've been praying in a certain manner, even if it's brought blessings, which it doubtless has, perhaps you can pray even more profitably by varying the pattern and by experimenting with fresh prayer formulas. One man I know opened a small business in New York City a number of years ago. He characterized his first establishment as a little hole in the wall. He had only one employee. In a few years, this man moved into more extensive quarters. It became a very successful operation. As he described it, his method of business was to fill the little hole in the wall 
with optimistic prayers and positive thoughts. He declared that hard work, positive thinking, fair dealing, right treatment of people, and the proper kind of praying always gets results. This man, who certainly has a creative and innovative mind, worked out his own formula for solving his problems. It's a curious formula, but I have practiced it myself, and I know that it works. The formula is, one, prayerize, two, picturize, three, actualize. By prayerize, he meant a daily system of creative prayer. When a problem arose, he talked it over with God very simply and directly. He didn't talk to God as to some vast and far-off shadowy being, but conceived of God as being with him there in his office, in his home, on the street, in his car, always nearby as a partner and close associate. He took seriously the biblical injunction to pray without ceasing. He interpreted this to mean that he should go about the business of each day discussing with God in a natural manner the questions and decisions that had to be resolved. He filled his daily life full of prayer. That is to say, he lived by prayer. For example, he would say, What will I do about this, Lord? Or give me a fresh insight on this, Heavenly Father. The presence of God finally came to dominate his conscious and ultimately his unconscious thinking. In effect, he prayerized his daily life and business. The second point in his formula of creative prayer is to picturize. We've all seen how the person who assumes success tends to already have success. People who assume failure tend to have failure. When either failure or success is pictured, there is a very strong tendency for that picture to actualize as fact and become reality. To assure something worthwhile happening, therefore, first pray about it and test it according to God's will. Then print a picture of it on your mind as happening, holding that image firmly in consciousness. Continue to check that picture to God's will, that is to say, put the matter in God's hands and follow God's guidance. Work hard and intelligently, thus doing your part to achieve success in the matter. Practice believing and continue to hold the picture firmly in your thoughts. Do this and you will be astonished at the ways in which that which is visualized comes to pass. For example, a woman became aware she and her husband were drifting apart. Theirs had been a happy marriage, but the wife became preoccupied with social affairs, and the husband had gotten super busy. Before they knew it, the old-time close companionship was gone. Then, one day, she discovered his interest in another woman. At this, she lost her head and became hysterical. When she consulted her minister, he listened to her tale and then turned the conversation to herself. She admitted that she had become self-centered, sharp-tongued, and nagging. She then confessed that she had never felt herself the equal of her husband. Her sense of inferiority 
had made her retreat actually into antagonism. The minister suggested that she create an image of herself as capable and attractive. He whimsically told her that God runs a beauty parlor and that faith techniques could put beauty on a person's face and charm and ease in their manner. He gave her instruction in how to pray and how to spiritually picturize. He also advised her to hold a mental image of the goodness of her husband and of being once again in harmony and companionship with him. She was to hold this picture tenaciously with faith. Soon after this, her husband informed her that he wanted a divorce. She had conquered herself enough by now to receive this request with calmness. She replied that she was willing if he wanted it, but suggested they defer the decision for 90 days. If he still wanted a divorce at the end of this period, she would cooperate with him. Night after night, he went out, and night after night, she sat at home. But now, she pictured him as seated in his old chair. She painted an image of him there, comfortably reading as in the old days. She visualized him puttering around the house, painting and fixing things as he used to do. She visualized the two of them playing golf together and taking hikes as they once did. She maintained this picture with steady faith and one night, what do you know? There he actually sat in his old chair. She looked twice to be sure that it was the reality rather than the picturization, but perhaps a picturization is a reality, for at any rate, the actual man was actually there. After that night, he still went out occasionally, but more and more frequently, he sat in his chair. Then he began to read to her, as in the old days. Finally, one sunny Saturday afternoon, he asked, what do you say to a game of golf? The days went by pleasantly until she realized that the 90th day had arrived. That evening, she said quietly, Bill, this is the 90th day. What do you mean, he asked, puzzled. The 90th day, why don't you remember? We agreed to wait 90 days to settle that divorce matter, and this is the day. He looked at her for a moment, and then, hidden behind his paper, he casually turned to Paige and said, Don't be silly. I couldn't possibly get along without you. Where did you get the idea I would ever leave you? When the New Testament says the kingdom of God is within you, it is informing us that God has provided us with all the potential abilities we need. It is up to us to tap and develop those powers. A man I know is the chief of four executives in a successful company. At regular intervals, these men have idea sessions. The purpose of these meetings is to tap all the creative ideas lurking in the minds of any of the four. For this session, they use a room without telephones, buzzers, or other usual office equipment. Before starting this session, the group spends 10 minutes in silent prayer and meditation. They conceive of God as creatively at work in their minds. Each prays and meditates silently in his own way. Following the quiet period, all start talking, pouring out ideas that have come to their minds. 
memos of the ideas are written on cards and thrown on the table. No one is permitted to criticize any idea at this point, for they believe that argument can stop the flow of creative thought. The cards are gathered up to be evaluated at a later session which follows this idea tapping session where thinking is stimulated by prayer power. As one of the executives explained, we've come up with insights that not only show on our bottom line, but which have given us a new feeling of confidence. Beyond that, a deeper feeling of fellowship among the four of us has grown, and this has spread to others as well. Alert people everywhere are finding that by trying prayer power, they feel better, work better, sleep better, are better. A young woman came to me a while ago and admitted that she was filled with hate jealousy, and resentment. She was also very apprehensive, always worrying about her children, that they would be sick or get into an accident or fail in school or something. Her life was an unhappy mixture of fear and worry. I told her that the practice of creative prayer could change her life. I suggested that she pray every day at the time the children were coming home from school and make her prayers an affirmation of God's protective care. Doubtful at first, she became a most enthusiastic practitioner of prayer. Here's what she wrote to me. My greatest progress dates from the time you told me that every day is a good day if you pray. I began to put into practice the idea of affirming that this would be a good day the minute I woke up in the morning, and I can positively say that I haven't had a bad or upsetting day since that time. The amazing thing is that my days actually haven't been any smoother or any more free from petty annoyances than they ever were, but they just don't seem to have the power to upset me anymore. Every night, I begin my prayers by listing all the things for which I am grateful, little things that added to the joy of the day. I know that this habit has geared my mind to pick out the nice things and forget the unpleasant ones. The fact that for six weeks I have not had a single bad day and have refused to get downhearted with anyone is really marvelous to me. Millions of people find tremendous power each day through prayer. Here are 10 suggestions for achieving effective results from your prayers. One. Set aside a few minutes each day. Do not say anything. Simply practice thinking about God. This will make your mind spiritually receptive. 2. Pray out loud using simple, natural words. Tell God anything that's on your mind. Talk to God in your own language. 3. Pray as you go about the business of the day, on the subway or bus or at your desk. Begin by closing your eyes to shut out the world and concentrate briefly on God's presence. Four, don't always ask for something when you pray, but instead affirm that God's blessings are being given and spend most of your prayers offering thanks. Five, pray with the belief that sincere prayers can reach out and surround your loved ones with God's love and protection. Six, never use a negative thought in prayer only positive thoughts get results. 7. Always express willingness to accept God's will. Ask for what you want, but be open to take what God gives you. It may be better than what you ask for. 8. Practice the attitude of putting everything into God's hands. Ask for the ability to do your best and then leave the results confidently to God. 
9. Pray for people you do not like or who have mistreated you. Resentment is the first obstacle to spiritual power. 10. Make a list of people for whom to pray. The more you pray for others, especially those not connected with you, the more the good results of prayer will come back to you. Some people, it seems, always have an extra dash of energy for just about any task they want to undertake. What's the secret? How do they do it? In this lesson, entitled Tune In to the Infinite, Dr. Peel talks about the source of all energy and how to tap into its boundless power. A Major League Baseball pitcher once played a long game when the temperature was over 100 degrees. He lost several pounds as a result of the afternoon's exertion, and at one stage of the game, his energy was severely depleted. But this man had a unique method for restoring energy. He simply repeated a passage from the Old Testament. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The pitcher completed the game with energy to spare. He explained the technique by saying, I sent a powerful energy-producing thought through my mind. As this baseball player discovered, prayer has the power to alter not only our attitudes, but our energy level as well. How we think we feel physically has a definite effect on how we actually feel. If your mind tells you that you're tired, the nerves and the muscles accept that as a fact. If your mind is intensely interested in something, you can keep on with an activity indefinitely. In the same way, our spiritual life functions through our thoughts, especially when we pray. When you tell yourself that you have powerful internal resources, you supply attitudes of faith to your mind. Such attitudes increase your energy and your well-being. A friend of mine, a man full of vitality and vigor, says that he goes to church regularly to get his batteries recharged. His concept is sound. God is the source of all energy. Atomic energy, electrical energy, spiritual energy. Indeed, every form of energy derives from the Creator. The Bible emphasizes this point when it says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increaseth strength. And here's how the Bible describes life's energizing and re-energizing process. In Him we live and move and have our being. In other words, from God we receive our vitality and our dynamic energy, and through Him we attain completeness. Contact with God establishes within us a flow of the same type of energy that recreates the world, that renews springtime every year. When we're in spiritual contact with God through our thoughts, Divine energy flows through us and automatically renews the original creative act. It's not unlike an electric clock connected to an outlet. The clock continues to keep time until it's unplugged. Then it stops because it has lost contact with its source of power. When we lose contact with our divine source of energy, much the same thing happens. We can tap into a reservoir of boundless power. And from this source, we can draw on unlimited energy for body and mind. A friend of mine, a man whose responsibilities are very heavy, works from morning until night without interruption. But this fellow always seems able to assume new obligations. Most importantly, he has the knack of handling his work easily and efficiently. One day I happened to be talking with his physician 
and I commented that I hoped this man wasn't setting a dangerous pace that could lead to a breakdown. The doctor shook his head. No, he replied, I don't think there's any danger of a crack-up. The reason is that he's a thoroughly well-organized individual with no energy leaks in his makeup. He handles things with easy power and carries burdens without strain. He never wastes an ounce of energy. Every effort is applied with maximum force. When asked to account for this seemingly boundless energy and efficiency, the physician stated, he's emotionally well integrated. And what's more important, he is a soundly religious person. His religion provides him with a workable mechanism for preventing energy leaks. It isn't hard work that drains off energy, but emotional upheaval. And this man is entirely free from that. More and more people are realizing that the maintenance of a sound spiritual and emotional life is an important factor in the enjoyment of a forceful personality. If proper attention is given to the spirit and the emotions, energy will be conserved. But if emotional reactions are not kept in balance, you will begin to see a drain on your vital force. When body, mind, and spirit work harmoniously, there is a natural and continuous replacement of necessary energy. It was the custom of Thomas A. Edison, the world's greatest inventive wizard, to come home from his laboratory after many hours of labor and lie down on his old couch. His wife said he would fall asleep as naturally as a child. In perfect relaxation, he would sink into a deep and untroubled slumber. After three to five hours, he would become instantly wide awake, completely refreshed, and eager to return to his work. When she was asked to analyze her husband's ability to rest in such a natural and complete manner, Mrs. Edison said, he was nature's man. By that she meant that he was completely in harmony with nature and with God. He was free from obsessions, disorganization, conflict, mental quirks, and emotional instability. He worked until he needed to sleep, then he slept soundly, arose, and returned to his work. He lived a long life and was in many respects the most creative mind ever to appear on the American continent. He drew his energy from emotional self-mastery, the ability to relax completely, his amazingly harmonious relationship with the universe, caused nature to reveal to him its inscrutable secrets. Every great personality I have ever known, and I have known many, who has demonstrated the capacity for prodigious work has been a person in tune with the infinite. Every such person seems in harmony with nature and in contact with divine energy. They haven't necessarily been pious people, but invariably they have been extraordinarily well organized from an emotional and psychological point of view. It is fear, resentment, inner conflicts, and obsessions that throw us off balance and thus cause the expensive and unnecessary expenditure of natural force. We are at last awakening to the close relationship between religion and health. We are beginning to comprehend a basic truth that our physical condition is determined very largely by our emotional condition and our emotional life is profoundly regulated by our thought life. All through its pages, the Bible talks about vitality and force and life. The supreme overall word of the Bible is life, and life means vitality, to be filled with energy. Jesus stated the key expression, 
I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Or as one version has it, I am come that they might have life and have it in all its fullness. This does not rule out pain or suffering or difficulty, but the clear implication is that if a person practices the creative and recreative principles of Christianity, he can live with power and energy. It's important to note that the practice of these principles will bring a person into the proper tempo of living. Our energies are frequently destroyed because of the abnormally high pace at which we go about our lives. To conserve energy, you must get your personality speed synchronized with the rate of God's movement. God is in you. If you are going at one rate and God at another, you will tear yourself apart. Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. The mills of most of us grind very rapidly, and so they grind poorly. When we become attuned to God's rhythm, we develop a normal tempo within ourselves, and energy flows freely. The hectic habits of this age have many disastrous effects. Everything is speeded up, and for that reason, many people feel unnecessarily tired. The solution is to get into the time synchronization of Almighty God. One way to do this is by going out some warm day and lying down on the earth. Get your ear close down to the ground and listen. You will hear all manner of sounds. You will hear the movement of the spheres, the wind in the trees, and the murmur of insects. You will discover presently that there is in all these sounds a well-regulated tempo. You cannot get that tempo by listening to traffic in the city streets, for it is lost in the confusion of sound. You can get it in church, where you hear the word of God and the great hymns. Truth vibrates to God's tempo in a church, but you can also find it in a factory if you have a mind to. To get yourself in tune with the rhythm of God, first allow yourself to relax physically. Then conceive of your mind as also relaxing. Then visualize the soul as becoming quiescent and pray as follows. Dear God, you are the source of all energy. You are the source of energy in the sun, in the atom, in all flesh, in the bloodstream, in the mind. I hereby draw energy from you as from an unlimited source. Then practice believing that you do receive energy. Keep in tune with the infinite. Of course, many people are tired simply because they aren't interested in anything. Nothing ever moves them deeply. To some people, it makes no difference what's going on or how things go. Their personal concerns are more important than all crises in human history. Nothing makes any real difference to them except their own little worries, desires, and hates. They wear themselves out by stewing about a lot of inconsequential things that amount to nothing. The surest way not to become tired is to lose yourself in something in which you have a profound conviction. A famous statesman finished his seventh speech of the day and still had energy to spare. I asked him why he wasn't tired, and he said, I believe absolutely in everything I said in those speeches. I'm enthusiastic about my convictions. And that's the secret. He was on fire for something. He was pouring himself out, and you never lose energy and vitality in so doing. 
You only lose energy when life becomes dull in your mind. When you're doing nothing, your mind gets bored, and then you feel tired. But you don't have to be tired. Get interested in something. Get absolutely enthralled in something. Throw yourself into it with abandon. Get out of yourself. Be somebody. Do something. Don't sit around moaning about things, reading the paper, saying, why don't they do something? The person who is out doing something isn't tired. The more you get absorbed in something bigger than yourself, the more energy you will have. You won't have time to think about yourself and get bogged down in your emotional difficulties. Another frequent cause of diminishing energy is staleness. The pressure, monotony, and unceasing continuity of responsibilities dull the freshness of mind which a person must have to approach his work successfully. During such dry periods, you have to expend much more energy to do with difficulty what you once did with comparative ease. A solution for this state of mind was employed by a businessman, the president of the board of trustees of a certain university. A professor who had once been outstanding and extraordinarily popular began to slip in teaching ability and in the power to stimulate his students. It was the verdict of the students, as well as the private opinion of the trustees, that this teacher must either recover his former teaching abilities or it would be necessary to replace him. The professor was told that the board of trustees was giving him a six months leave of absence with all expenses paid and with full salary. There was only one stipulation, that he go away to a place of rest and give himself over to gaining a complete renewal of strength and energy. The president of the board invited him to use a cabin which he himself owned in a wilderness setting and made the curious suggestion that he take no books except one, the Bible. He suggested that the professor's daily program be walking, fishing, some manual work in the garden, and an extended period of reading the Bible. He encouraged the professor to memorize as many passages as possible in order to saturate his mind with the great words and ideas which the book contains. He said, I believe that if you spend six months outdoors chopping wood, digging in the soil, reading the Bible, and fishing in deep lakes, you will become a new man. The professor agreed to this unique proposal. His adjustment to this radically different mode of life was an easier one than he or anyone who knew him expected. In fact, he was surprised to find that he actually liked it. After he became accustomed to active outdoor living, he discovered it had an immense appeal for him. He missed his intellectual associates and his reading for a while, but forced back upon the Bible, his only book, he became immersed in it. To his amazement, he found the Bible to be, as he put it, a library within itself. In the pages of the Bible, he found faith and peace and power. In six months, he was a new man. When he returned to teaching, his colleagues and students found him a person of compelling power and exciting inspiration. His staleness had gone, and the old-time energy returned. The spiritual retreat caused his power to surge again and renewed his zest for living. Here are a few suggestions for increasing your energy and vitality. One, remember, how you think you feel physically has a definite effect on how you actually feel. Tell yourself frequently that you have powerful internal resources. Two, God is the source of all energy. To tap into this boundless reservoir, repeat this affirmation. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. 3. 
try to stay in harmony with nature and in contact with divine energy. People who are free of fear, resentment, inner conflicts, and obsessions have an abundance of energy because they don't waste their precious emotional resources. 4. Get interested in something. People frequently feel tired because they aren't on fire for something outside their own small circle of interests. 5. Rejuvenate your spirit by taking yourself away from daily routines. Take along a Bible as your companion. In a chaotic world, a sense of inner harmony is increasingly difficult to achieve. And yet, tranquility is essential to both physical and emotional well-being. In this section, entitled, A Peaceful Mind Generates Power, you will learn one of the most important characteristics of a happy and successful person, peace of mind. How often have you found yourself complaining about how poorly you slept the night before, that you went to bed with an ear full of trouble? Given the choice, wouldn't you rather fall asleep with a mind full of peace? The secret to a mind full of peace lies in one's mental attitude. The life of strain is very difficult. On the other hand, the life of inner peace, being harmonious and without stress, is the easiest type of existence. It is a life which accepts God's gift of peace and embraces the attitude of relaxed trust in him. The first technique recommended is to practice emptying the mind. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of a frequent mental catharsis. This means clearing the mind of fears, hates, insecurities, regrets, and guilt. The mere attempt to empty the mind tends to give relief. Haven't you ever experienced a welcome sense of release when you've poured out your troubles to somebody you can trust? One effective method for doing this is the daily practice of silence. Everyone should insist upon at least 15 minutes of absolute silence every day. Go alone into the quietest place available and sit or lie down. Do not talk, do not write, do not read. Think as little as possible. Conceive of your mind as the surface of a body of water and see how nearly quiet you can make it so that there isn't even a ripple. When you've attained a quiescent state, begin to listen for the deeper sounds of harmony and beauty and of God that are to be found in the essence of silence. I was once conducting a religious service on an ocean liner on a voyage to Hawaii. In the course of my talk, I suggested that people who were carrying worries in their minds go to the stern of the vessel and imaginatively take each anxious thought out and drop it into the ocean and watch it disappear in the wake of the ship. It seemed an almost childlike suggestion but a man who had quite a no-nonsense manner came to me later that day and said, you know something? Every evening at sunset, as long as this voyage lasts, I'm going to drop all my worries overboard until I develop the ability to cast them entirely out of my consciousness at will. Every day I shall watch them disappear in the great 
ocean of time. Doesn't the Bible say something about forgetting those things that are behind? Of course, just emptying the mind is not enough to prevent those old unhappy thoughts from sneaking in again. You must refill the mind immediately with creative and healthy thoughts. These happy thoughts will stand guard when the old fears, hates, and worries that used to haunt you try to edge back in again. At intervals during the day, practice thinking a carefully selected series of peaceful thoughts. Let mental pictures of the most peaceful scenes you have ever witnessed pass across your mind. For example, you might see a beautiful valley filled with the hush of evening time as the shadows lengthen and the sun sinks to rest. Or you could recall the silvery light of the moon falling upon rippling waters or the sea washing gently upon soft shores of sand. Serene images like these will work upon your mind as a healing medicine. You might also practice the techniques of repeating beautiful words out loud. Words have profound suggestive power and there is healing in the very saying of them. Utter a series of panicky words and your mind will immediately go into a mild state of nervousness. You will perhaps feel a sinking in the pit of your stomach that soon affects your entire body. If, on the other hand, you speak peaceful, quieting words, your mind will react in a peaceful manner. Use such words as, for example, tranquility. Repeat the word slowly several times. Tranquility is one of the most beautiful and melodic of all English words, and the mere saying of it tends to induce a tranquil state. It is also helpful to use lines from poetry. When peaceful quotations are dropped in the subconscious, they lubricate the mind with peace. Here is one from a 16th century mystic. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. Everything passes away except God. God alone is sufficient. The words of the Bible have a particularly strong therapeutic value. Drop them into the mind, allowing them to dissolve in consciousness and they will spread a healing balm over your entire being. For attaining peace of mind, this is one of the simplest things to do and also one of the most effective. There are other practical ways by which you can develop a serene state of mind. One way is through your conversations. Depending upon the words we use and the tone in which we use them, we can talk ourselves into being nervous, high-strung, and upset. But by our speech, we can also achieve quiet reactions. Talk peaceful to be peaceful. You see, the words we speak have a direct and definite effect upon our thoughts. So in a group, when the conversation takes an upsetting trend, Try injecting peaceful ideas into the talk. Note how it counteracts the tension. A conversation filled with unhappy expectation, at breakfast, for example, often sets the tone of the entire day. On the other hand, if you start each day by affirming peaceful attitudes, your days will tend to be pleasant, and successful. Perhaps our lack of inner peace is due in part to the effect of today's 
increased levels of noise. Research indicates that certain amounts of noise in the place we work, live, or sleep affects the nervous system and reduces efficiency. Contrary to popular belief, it is doubtful if we ever completely adjust to some noises. No matter how familiar a repeated sound becomes, it never passes unheard by the subconscious. Automobile horns, the roar of airplanes, and other strident noises actually result in physical activity during sleep. Impulses transmitted to and through the nerves by these sounds cause muscular movements which keep us from getting a real rest. On the other hand, the practice of silence is healing, soothing, and healthy. The sense of rest that results from the practice of complete silence is of utmost value. Now there is another factor in the search for inner peace that I must mention. Frequently I find that people who lack a sense of inner peace are victims of self-punishment. At some time in their life, they've committed a sin and are then haunted by a sense of guilt. Sometimes this type of person has sought divine forgiveness and the good Lord we know always forgives someone who asks him and who means it. However, there is a curious quirk in the human personality that sometimes won't allow an individual to forgive himself. A person like this feels he deserves punishment and is therefore always anticipating punishment. As a result, he lives in constant apprehension that something bad is going to happen. In order to find peace under these circumstances, he feels he must intensify his activity. He thinks that hard work will give him some release from his sense of guilt. A physician told me that a number of cases of nervous breakdown in his practice were linked to such guilt feelings where the patients unconsciously attempted to compensate by hectic overwork. Then they attributed their breakdown not to a sense of guilt, but to their overworked condition. This doctor told me that such a breakdown needn't happen if only the patient could be released from his guilt. Under such circumstances, peace of mind can be found by yielding the guilt as well as the tension it produces to the healing therapy of God. I once encountered an acquaintance at a quiet resort hotel. This was a high-pressured, hard-driving, and exceedingly nervous businessman. I found him sitting in the sun in a deck chair and said I was glad to see him relaxing in such a beautiful spot. Nervously, he replied, I haven't any business being here. I have so much work to do at home. I'm under terrible pressure. I'm nervous, jumpy, I can't sleep. My wife insisted that I come down here for a week. The doctors say there's nothing wrong with me that right thinking and relaxation can't cure. But how in the world do I do that? I would do anything to get a sense of quiet inside myself. We talked a bit, and it came out that he was always worrying that something sinister was going to happen. For years, he had lived in a constant state of apprehension about something happening to his wife or his children or his home. It was not difficult to analyze this case. His trouble rose from a double source, from childhood insecurities and from later guilty experiences. His mother had always felt that something was going to happen and he absorbed her anxiety feelings. 
Later, he committed some sins, and his subconscious mind insisted upon self-punishment. As a result of this unhappy combination, he was now suffering from a highly inflamed state of nervousness. Finishing our conversation, I stood beside his chair a moment. There was no one near, so I rather hesitantly suggested, would you by any chance like me to pray with you? He nodded, and I put my hand on his shoulder and prayed. Dear Jesus, as you healed people in the long ago and gave them peace, heal this man now. Give him fully of thy forgiveness and help him to forgive himself. Separate him from all his sins and let him know that you do not hold them against him. Set him entirely free from them. Then let thy peace flow into his mind, into his soul, and into his body. He looked up at me with a strange expression on his face and then turned away, for there were tears in his eyes. Months later, I ran into him in New York, and he said, Something happened to me that day when you prayed for me. I felt a strange sense of quietness and peace, and he added, healing. This man now goes to church regularly and reads the Bible every day. He follows the laws of God and has a great deal of driving force. This is a healthy, happy man. For now, he has peace in his heart and in his mind. If you are having trouble finding peace of mind, here are a few exercises. One, every day put aside 15 minutes for yourself when you can find absolute silence. Go alone into a quiet place and sit or lie down. Think as little as possible. Allow the silence to open you up to feelings of harmony and beauty. Two, from time to time during the day, practice concentrating on a selected series of peaceful thoughts. Think of your past as a painting from which you can choose the most serene moments you have ever experienced. Allow your mind to dwell in those scenes until you feel you are present in that place and absorbing its tranquility. Three, practice the technique of repeating beautiful words out loud. Words have profound powers of suggestion and there is healing in the very saying of them. Four, the words of the Bible are especially therapeutic. Drop them into your mind, allowing them to dissolve in your consciousness, replacing negative thoughts. When your daily pace is a frantic one, it's more important than ever to remember that peace of mind is essential to efficiency, no matter what you do. Dr. Peel's prescription for accomplishing more in your life is to relax for easy power through the healing properties of calmness and quiet. Do you ever fume and fret? Here is a picture of yourself if you do. The word fume means to boil up, to blow off, to be agitated. It conjures up images of someone who is seething and distraught. The word fret is equally descriptive. It is reminiscent of a sick child in the night, a petulant and irritating half cry, half whine. To fret is a term usually used when talking about children, but unfortunately it frequently describes the emotional reaction of many adults. The Bible advises us to fret not thyself. This is sound advice for people of our time. If we are to have power to live effectively, we just need to stop fuming and fretting and find instead real peace of mind. But how do you go about doing that? A first step is to reduce your pace 
or at least the tempo of your pace. We don't usually realize how fast we're driving ourselves. Many people destroy their bodies by this pace, but even worse, they tear their minds and souls to shreds as well. The pace at which we live is determined by our thinking habits. It's possible for someone to live a quiet, physical existence and yet maintain a fast tempo emotionally. When the mind goes rushing on pell-mell from one feverish attitude to another, it becomes feverish too. This overstimulation produces fatigue, frustration, and emotional illness. And if this effect is so physically and emotionally pronounced, imagine what it does to that deep inner essence of the personality known as the soul. It is impossible to have peace of soul if one's tempo is so feverishly accelerated. God simply won't go that fast. He will not endeavor to keep up with you. He says, in effect, go ahead if you must with this foolish pace, and when you are worn out, I will offer you my healing. But I can make your life rich if only you will slow down and live and move and have your being in me. You see, God moves imperturbably, slowly, and with perfect organization. The only wise rate at which to live is at God's rate. God gets things done, and they are done right, and he does them without hurrying. He neither fumes nor frets. He is peaceful and therefore very efficient. This same peace is offered to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Sometimes I wonder if this generation isn't so accustomed to tension and noise that many aren't comfortable without it. The deep quietness of woods and valleys, so well known to our forefathers, is almost an alien state to them. It seems that the tempo of their lives doesn't allow them to draw upon the marvelous sources of peace and quietness that the physical world offers. One summer afternoon, my wife and I went for a long walk in the woods. We were stopping at a beautiful lake mountain house, which is set in one of the finest natural parks in this country, 7,500 acres of virgin mountainside, in the middle of which is a lake that is set like a gem in the forest. Here you come out of the deep woods onto some noble promontory and rest your eyes on great valleys set among hills, rock-ribbed and ancient as the sun. These woods, mountains, and valleys constitute what ought to be a sure retreat from every confusion in this world. On this afternoon as we walked, there was a mixture of summer showers and sunlit hours we were drenched and started to fret about it a bit because it took the press out of our clothes. Then we told each other that it doesn't hurt a human being to get drenched with clean rainwater, that the rain feels cool and fresh on one's face, and that you can always sit in the sun and dry yourself out. So we walked under the trees and talked and then fell silent. We were listening, listening deeply to the quietness. In a strict sense, the woods are never still. There is tremendous activity always in the process. But on this beautiful afternoon, nature's sounds were quiet, harmonious. Nature was laying its hand of healing quietness upon us, and we could actually feel the tension being drawn off. Just as we were falling under this spell, 
the faint sounds of something passing for music came to us. It was a nervous, high-strung music, so popular these days. And presently through the woods came three young people, and one of them was lugging a portable radio. They were three young city people out for a walk in the woods, and tragically enough were bringing their noise along with them. They were nice folk, too, for they stopped and we had a pleasant talk with them. It occurred to me to ask him to turn that thing off and listen to the music of the woods. But I didn't feel it was my business to instruct them, and finally they went on their way. We commented on the loss they were incurring, that they could pass through this peacefulness and not give ear to the music that is as old as the world, harmony and melody the like of which man has never equaled, the song of the wind through the trees, the sweet notes of birds singing their hearts out, the whole background of the music of the spheres. Remember the words of Jesus, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Frequently enough, I've had to remind myself to practice this truth, but we must discipline ourselves to quietness if we expect its benefits in our lives. To help reduce the tension that seems to dominate people everywhere, you can start by reducing your pace. To do that, you will need to slow down and quiet down. Do not fume, do not fret. Practice being peaceful. Practice the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Then note the quiet sense of power that wells up within you. A physician gave some rather unusual advice to a patient of his, one of those aggressive, go-getter types of businessmen. This man had been telling him that he takes his briefcase home with him every night, packed with important work that must get done right away. When the doctor asked if someone else couldn't help him with it, the man snapped, nope, I'm the only one who can do it. Everything depends on me. The doctor asked, if I write a prescription, will you follow it? This, believe it or not, was the prescription. His patient was to take off two hours every working day and go for a long walk. Then he was to take off a half day a week and spend that half day in a cemetery. In astonishment, the patient demanded, why should I spend a half day in a cemetery? Because, answered the doctor, I want you to wander around and look at the gravestones of men who are there permanently. I want you to meditate on the fact that many of them are there because they thought, even as you do, that the whole world rested on their shoulders. Meditate on the solemn fact that when you get there permanently, the world will go on just the same. There are times when it is essential to check our headlong pace, and it must be emphasized that the only way to stop is to stop. Believe me, I know personally from experience. I once went to a certain city to give a lecture and was met at the plane by a committee. I was rushed to a bookstore where I had an autographing party and then to another bookstore where another autographing party was held. Then they rushed me to a luncheon. After rushing through the luncheon, I was rushed to a meeting. After the meeting, I was rushed back to the hotel where I changed my clothes and was rushed back to a reception where I met several hundred people and drank three glasses of fruit punch. Then I was rushed back to the hotel and told I had 20 minutes to dress for dinner. 
When I was getting dressed, the phone rang, and somebody said, Hurry, hurry, we must rush down to dinner. Excitedly, I chattered, I will rush right down. I rushed from the room and was so excited that I could scarcely get the key into the lock. Hastily, I checked myself to make sure I was completely dressed and rushed toward the elevator. All of a sudden, I stopped. I was out of breath. I asked myself, just what is this all about? What is the meaning of this ceaseless rush? This is ridiculous. Then I declared independence and said, I don't care if I go to dinner or not. I do not care whether I make a speech. I do not have to go to this dinner, and I do not have to give a speech. So deliberately and slowly, I walked back to my room and took my time about opening the door. I telephoned the man downstairs and said, if you want to eat, go ahead. If you want to save a place for me, I will be down after a while when I'm good and ready. But I'm not going to rush anymore. So I removed my coat, sat down, took off my shoes, put my feet up on the table, and just sat. Then I opened the Bible and very slowly read aloud the 121st Psalm. I will lift up mine eyes under the hills from whence cometh my help. I closed the book and had a little talk with myself, saying, Come on now, son, start living a slower pace and a more relaxed life. And then I affirmed, God is here and his peace is touching me. I don't need anything to eat, I reasoned. I eat too much anyway. Besides, the dinner will probably not be very good, and if I am quiet now, I will give a better speech at 8 o'clock. So I sat there resting and praying for a while. I shall never forget the sense of peace and personal mastery I had when I walked out of that room. I had the glorious feeling of having overcome something, of having taken control of myself emotionally. And when I reached the dining room, the others had just finished the first course. All I missed was the soup, which by general consent was no great loss. This incident was an amazing encounter with the healing presence of Almighty God. I gained this experience simply by stopping by quietly reading the Bible, by sincerely praying, and by thinking some peaceful thoughts for a few moments. To attain emotional control, the daily practice of healing techniques is essential. Emotional control cannot be gained in any magical or easy way. The only sure method is by working at it regularly and by developing creative faith. To develop a calm control, it is necessary to think calmness. For as I've said before, the body responds sensitively to the type of thoughts that pass through the mind. It is also true that the mind can be quieted by first making the body quiet. Don't pace the floor. Don't wring your hands. Don't pound or shout or argue or walk up and down. Don't let yourself get worked up into a dither. I was once in a meeting where a discussion was going on which finally became rather bitter. Tempers were getting frayed and some of the participants were decidedly on edge. Sharp remarks were exchanged. Suddenly one man got up, took off his coat, opened his collar and lay down on a couch. Everyone was astonished, and someone asked if he felt ill. No, he said, I feel fine, but I'm beginning to get mad, and I have learned that it is difficult to get mad lying down. We all laughed, and the tension was broken, so I urge you to slow down. For whatever you really want, 
will be there when you arrive if you work toward it without stress, without pressing. If proceeding under God's guidance and in his smooth and unhurried tempo it is not there, then it was not supposed to be there. If you miss it, perhaps you should have missed it. Try to develop a normal, natural, God-ordered pace. Practice and preserve mental quiet. Learn the art of letting go of all nervous excitement. To do this, stop at intervals and affirm. I now relinquish nervous excitement. It is flowing from me now. I am at peace. If you have a tendency to fume and fret, here are some exercises that can help you achieve a more peaceful inner tempo. One, sit relaxed in a chair. Yield yourself completely to the chair. Starting with your toes and proceeding to the top of your head, conceive of every part of your body as relaxing. Affirm this relaxed state by saying, my toes are relaxed, my fingers are relaxed, my facial muscles are relaxed, and so on. Two, think of your mind as the surface of a lake in a storm, tossed by waves and whipped by the wind. Then imagine the waves subside and the surface placid and smooth. Three, spend two or three minutes thinking of the most beautiful and peaceful scenes you have ever beheld. A mountain at sunset, for example, or a deep valley filled with the hush of early morning, or a woods at noonday, or moonlight upon rippling waters. In your memory, relive these scenes. Four, make a mental list of times in your life when you've been conscious of God's watchful care. Recall how he brought things out right and took care of you when you were worried and anxious. Then recite aloud this line from an old hymn. So long thy power hath kept me, sure it still will lead me on. Five, repeat the following quotation, which has a great power to relax and quiet the mind. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Repeat this aloud, if possible, so that by the end of the day, you will have said it many times. Conceive of these words as active, vital substances that permeate your mind and send a healing balm to every area of your heart and mind. The connection between the mind and the body is a subtle but powerful one. Emotional turmoil can sap your energy, reduce your efficiency, cause poor health, and of course, steal your chances for happiness. Here's Dr. Peel with some thoughts on reversing this process and restoring your vitality. A physician I know says many of his patients have nothing wrong with them except their thoughts. He has a favorite prescription for some of them, and it's a verse from the Bible, no less. It reads, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He finds that when his patients change the pattern of their thoughts, they actually achieve a more peaceful state of mind. And that helps to produce health and well-being. Many people can benefit from such a prescription of prayer, faith, and dynamic spiritual thinking. Here's an example. The sales manager of a large company had experienced a serious decline in both ability and energy. He had once been a man of outstanding efficiency and power, but in the last year or so, he lost his creative skill and sales were slipping badly. Two vacations brought no improvement. This man's physician recommended to the company president that his patient come to our religio psychiatric clinic for an interview. When he arrived, he was rather indignant at being sent to a church. 
This is a pretty pass, he fumed, when they send a businessman to a preacher. I suppose you're going to pray with me and read the Bible, he said irritably. Well, I wouldn't be surprised, I answered, for sometimes our trouble lies in an area where prayer and the therapy of the Bible can have an important effect. He proved most sullen and uncooperative until I was finally forced to say to him, Listen, I want to tell you bluntly that you'd better cooperate with us or you're going to be fired. Who told you that, he demanded. Your boss, I replied. In fact, he says that unless we can straighten you out, as much as he regrets it, you're through. You never saw such a stunned expression on anybody's face. What do you think I ought to do, he finally stammered. A person often gets himself into the state you're in, I replied, because the mind is filled with fear, anxiety, tension, resentment, guilt, or a combination of all of these. When these ingredients accumulate to a certain weight, the personality cannot support them any longer and gives way. Normal sources of emotional, spiritual, and intellectual power become clogged up. The person becomes bogged down by resentment, fear, or guilt. I don't know your trouble, but I suggest you think of me as a sympathetic friend with whom you can be absolutely open and that you begin to tell me all about yourself. I emphasize the importance of concealing nothing and of emptying whatever fears, resentments, or guilt feelings might be in his mind. It was rather difficult to get him to talk, for he was essentially a decent person and had a strong sense of shame. In due course, the troubles came out. He'd committed a series of sins, and these involved him in a complicated maze of lies. He was living in fear of exposure, and all in all, it was a most pathetic mass of inner confusion. I shall never forget the way he reacted when it was all over. Standing on his feet, he began to stretch, he stood on tiptoes, reaching his fingers toward the ceiling, and then took a deep breath. My, he said, I feel good. It was a dramatic expression of release and relief. Then I suggested that he pray and ask God to forgive him and to fill him with peace and cleanness. Do you mean for me to pray aloud, he asked dubiously. I never did that in my whole life. Yes, I said, it's a good practice, one that will strengthen you. It was a simple prayer, and as best as I can recall it, this is what he said. Dear Lord, I've been an unclean man, and I'm sorry for the wrong I have done. I've poured it all out to my friend here. I now ask you to forgive me and to fill me with peace. Also, make me strong so that I will never repeat these actions. Help me to be clean again and better, lots better. He went back to his office that very day. Nothing was ever said to him, and it did not need to be, for soon he got back into stride and regained his position as one of the best sales managers in his city. Later, I met his president, who said, I don't know what you did to Bill, but now he certainly is a ball of fire. It wasn't me, I replied. God did it. Every thoughtful person who has ever considered the matter realizes that doctors are right when they tell us that grudges, resentment, jealousy, vindictiveness, hate, and so on are attitudes that produce poor health. The effects of anger are among the worst, 
have a fit of anger and experience for yourself that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach, that sense of sickness. Chemical reactions in the body are set up by emotional outbursts, which in turn result in feelings of ill health. Should these continue, either violently or in a simmering state over a period of time, the general condition of the body will deteriorate. Violent negative emotions place great strain upon the heart. One doctor describes how common it is for a person's blood pressure to jump 60 points almost instantly in response to an outburst of anger. A colleague of his suffered from a heart condition and knew that he was at the mercy of anyone who could annoy him. His death, in fact, resulted from a heart attack caused by a fit of anger when he forgot to discipline himself. This doctor suggests Whenever a problem starts to vex you or you begin to get angry, let yourself go limp all over. This will dissipate your inner turmoil. In a speech to the American College of Physicians, Dr. Edward Weiss of Temple University Medical School stated that emotions and feelings are quite as real as germs and no less respectable in their power. The pain and suffering of diseases caused primarily by the emotions are no more imaginary than those caused by bacteria. For example, chronic victims of pains and aches in the muscles and joints may be suffering from nursing a smoldering grudge against someone possibly close to them. And usually a patient is completely unconscious of his own role in developing the disease. Such persons are often suffering from a disorder of their feelings, often linked to a marital or parent-child problem. I was once told about a woman who came to her doctor complaining that her hands kept breaking out, a problem which was diagnosed as eczema. This doctor encouraged his patient to talk about herself. It turned out that she was a very rigid, unhappy person, and he encouraged her to see a psychiatrist for help. The psychiatrist saw at once that there was some irritating situation in her life that she was translating outwardly in the form of a skin rash. Thus, she was taking out on her own body the urge to scratch something or someone. The doctor finally put it to her bluntly. What's eating you? You're peeved at something, aren't you? He reported that she stiffened up like a ramrod and marched right out of the office, so he knew he'd been on target. A few days later, she came back. Due to the agony of the eczema, she was ready to let him help her, even if it meant she had to give up a hatred. It turned out to be a family argument about a will. This woman felt she'd been unfairly treated by a younger brother. When she got rid of her hostility and made up with her brother, the eczema vanished within 24 hours. Such cases go on and on. When people allow their emotions to get the better of them, their body responds by breaking down in small or sometimes in large and grave ways. How we think we feel physically has a definite effect on how we do feel. If your mind tells you you're tired or ill, the nerves and the muscles accept that as a fact. On the other hand, if you convince yourself that you feel refreshed and healthy, 
energy and well-being can also be generated. The body is designed to produce all the energy you need over an amazingly long period of time. To have good health, a person must take reasonable care of his body with proper diet, exercise, sleep, and so on. To complete the prescription, a well-balanced emotional life is also necessary. When body, mind, and spirit work harmoniously, energy is continuously replaced. The longer I live, the more I'm convinced that neither age nor circumstance needs to deprive us of energy and vitality. If you are feeling under par, I recommend that you do a very scrupulous self-analysis. Honestly ask yourself if you're harboring any ill will or resentment or grudges, and if so, cast them out. Every day and every night of your life, these feelings eat away at you. Emotional ills sap your energy, reduce your efficiency, cause poor health, and of course, they steal your chances for happiness. And yet some people still think that when the Bible tells us not to hate or get angry, it is theoretical advice. The Bible is not theoretical. It is our greatest book of wisdom. It is filled with practical advice on living and on health. Since irritation, anger, hate, and resentment have such a powerful effect on our health, what is the antidote? Obviously, the solution is to fill the mind with attitudes of goodwill, forgiveness, faith, love, and an indomitable spirit. To get you started in conquering such negative emotions, here are some practical suggestions. One, remember that anger is an emotion, and an emotion is always warm, even hot. To reduce an emotion, cool it. We all know that when a person gets angry, hands clench, the voice rises stridently, muscles tense, the body becomes rigid. Physically, you become poised to fight with adrenaline shooting through your body. To counter this reaction, deliberately oppose the heat of this emotion with coolness. Freeze it out. Use your will to keep your hands from clenching by holding your fingers out straight. Deliberately reduce the tone of your voice. Bring it down to a whisper. Slump in a chair or even lie down if possible. Remember, it's difficult to argue in a whisper or even get mad while lying down. Two. At the moment, it may be a bit hard to pray, but try it anyway. At least conjure up a picture of God in your mind and try to think of Him angry as you are. You can't do it, and the effort will serve to puncture your hostility. 3. Instead of counting to 10 when you feel anger mounting, try the first 10 words of the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Say that ten times and your anger will lose its power over you. 4. Anger is an emotion which is sometimes the accumulation of many minor irritations. These irritations, each rather small, gather force as one is added to another, finally bursting forth in a fury. To dry up the tiny drops that feed the great river of anger, make a list of everything that irritates you, no matter how inconsequential it may seem. Then make each separate irritation a special object of prayer. Get a victory over each, one at a time. Instead of destroying all of your consolidated anger, use prayer to snip away at each annoyance that feeds it. 5. When a situation occurs in which your feelings are hurt, get it straightened out as quickly as possible. Don't brood over it. Do something about it. Don't allow yourself to sulk or indulge in self-pity or mope around with resentful thoughts. If your feelings are hurt, see if you can talk to the person you're having trouble with. Try to resolve the situation right away so the incident doesn't get distorted or out of proportion. Put some spiritual iodine on the hurt by saying a prayer of love and forgiveness. Six. 
Allow the grievance to drain out of your mind. Go to someone you trust and pour it out until not a vestige of it remains within you. Then forget it. 7. Pray for people who hurt your feelings. Continue this until you feel the malice fading away. You may have to pray for quite a while to get this result. 8. Say this little prayer. May the love of God fill my heart. Then add this line. May the love of God for that person who has hurt me flood my soul. Pray this and mean it. Take the advice of Jesus literally when he said to forgive 70 times 7. That comes to 490 times. Before you have forgiven a person that many times, you will be free of resentment. Worry can have a devastating effect on your physical and emotional health. It stifles the flow of creative power and cripples the ability to act with confidence and clarity. But there is a remedy for overcoming fear. Here is Dr. Peel. Reduced to its simplest form, what is worry? Basically, worry is an unhealthy and destructive mental habit. But if you're a worrier, you weren't born with the habit. You acquired it, and like any habit or acquired attitude, you can cast worry from your mind. A famous psychiatrist asserts that anxiety is the great modern plague. Professionals tell us that fear is the most disintegrating enemy of the human personality, that worry is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases that thousands of people are ill because of damned up anxiety. Because these sufferers are unable to expel their anxieties, they've turned their problems inward, causing many forms of ill health. The destructive quality of worry is indicated by the word itself, which is derived from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning to choke. If someone were to put his fingers around your throat and press hard, cutting off the flow of air and blood, it would be a dramatic demonstration of what you do to yourself by long-held and habitual worry. The warrior, so it seems, is not likely to live as long as the person who learns to overcome his worries. A study of some 450 people who lived to be 100 years of age found that the following reasons contributed to their long and contented lives. One, they kept busy. Two, they used moderation in all things. Three, they ate lightly and simply. Four, they got a great deal of fun out of life. Five, they were early to bed and early to rise. Six, they were free from worry and fear, especially the fear of death. Seven, they had serene minds and faith in God. Have you ever heard a person say, I'm almost sick with worry, and then add with a laugh, but I guess worry never really makes you ill. But that is where they are wrong. Worry can make you ill. The problem is we worry not only with our minds, but with our hearts, brains, and every other part of ourselves. No matter what the cause of worry and fear, its effect can be noted in the cells, tissues, and organs. But don't be discouraged. There is a remedy that will bring you sure relief. You can overcome your worries. The first step is simply believing you can. For whatever you believe you can do, with God's help, you can do. Here, then, is a practical procedure which will help to eliminate abnormal worry from your daily life. Practice emptying the mind daily. This is a suggestion I will repeat over and over again. 
for it is of utmost importance. To avoid retaining worries in your mind while you sleep, this mental catharsis should be done preferably before retiring at night. The last five minutes before going to sleep are of extraordinary importance, for in that brief period the mind is most receptive to suggestion. It tends to absorb the last ideas that are entertained in the waking state. Then while you sleep, thoughts sink into the subconscious. This process of mind letting is important in overcoming worry because fearful thoughts can clog the mind and impede the flow of mental and spiritual power. But if such thoughts are eliminated daily, they will not accumulate. To help drain away these thoughts, you might use a process of creative imagination in which you conceive of yourself as actually emptying your mind of all anxiety and fear. Think of the remarkable imaginative skill of small children. Watch how they respond to the game of kissing away a hurt. Imagination is not simply the use of fantasy. The word imagination comes from the idea of imaging, that is, creating images in our mind. Imagineering is the use of mental images to build factual results, and it is an astonishingly effective procedure. What you create with your imagination, whether it is an image of fear or of release from fear, may ultimately become a fact if it is held in your mind with sufficient faith. Here's one method you might use. Picture all your worry thoughts flowing out from you in the same way that water flows from a basin by removing the stopper. During this visualization, repeat the following affirmation. With God's help, I am now emptying my mind of all anxiety, all fear, all sense of insecurity. Repeat this slowly five times. Then add, I believe that my mind is now emptied of all anxiety, all fear, all sense of insecurity. Repeat the statement five times while holding a mental picture of your mind as being emptied. Then thank God for thus freeing you from fear and then go to sleep. When you're beginning the curative process, use this method mid-morning and mid-afternoon as well as bedtime. Go into some quiet place for five minutes for this purpose. Do this faithfully, and you will soon know its beneficial results. In due course, this thinking will drive out worry. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of freeing your mind from worry and fear. Fear something over a long period of time and there is a real possibility that you may actually help bring it to pass. The Bible contains a line which is one of the most terrible statements ever made, terrible in its truth. It's this, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. Of course it will. For if you fear something continuously, you tend to create conditions in your mind that encourage its development. Faith is the one power against which fear cannot stand. Master faith, and you will automatically master fear. As the Bible also suggests, that which I have greatly believed has come upon me. In many different ways, the Bible tells us that if we have faith, nothing is impossible. 
So if you shift your mind from fear to faith, you will stop creating the object of your fear and will instead create the object of your faith. In the campaign against the worry habit, here's a useful strategy. The vast tree of worry which has grown up in your personality over long years can best be handled by making it as small as possible. First, snip off the little worries and expressions of worry. For example, reduce the number of worry words in your conversation. Words may be the result of worry, but they also create worry. When a worry thought comes to mind, immediately remove it with a faith expression. For example, instead of saying, I'm worried that I will miss the train, put the worry out of your mind with a prayer and get started a little earlier. The less worrying you do, the more likely you are to be well organized, for the uncluttered mind is systematic and better able to regulate time. A friend of mine says that every morning before he gets up, he repeats the words, I believe, three times. Thus, at the day's beginning, he conditions his mind to faith and it never leaves him. His mind accepts the conviction that by faith he is going to overcome his problems and difficulties during the day. He starts the day with creative, positive thinking in his mind. He believes, and it is very hard to hold back the person who believes. Many people fail to overcome troubles such as worry because they allow a problem to seem complicated. It can be very useful to attack the problem with some simple technique, something that dramatizes your war against worry. One of the best techniques I've seen was developed by a man who was once a tremendous worrier. At one point, he was worrying himself into a bad state of nerves and ill health. He suffered from continual doubt about whether or not he had done or said the right thing. He was always rehashing his decisions and getting unnerved about them. I suggested that he ought to work out some simple method that would help him drop the day completely when it was over and go ahead into the future. One day, I noticed that his state of mind was improving, and I commented on it. Oh, yes, he said, I finally got the secret, and it has worked amazingly well. He asked me to drop into his office sometime during the close of the day, and he would show me how he had broken the worry habit. One evening, I did, and he explained that he'd worked out a little ritual to perform every night before leaving his office. We picked up our hats and coats and started toward the door. By the door stood a wastebasket, and above it on the wall was a calendar. You could see only one date at a time, and that date was in large print. He said, now I will perform my evening ritual, the one that has helped me break the worry habit. He reached up and tore off the calendar page for that day. He rolled it into a small ball, and I watched with fascination as his fingers slowly opened and he dropped that day into the wastebasket. He then closed his eyes and his lips moved. Upon finishing his prayer, he said, Amen. Okay, the day is over. Come on, let's go out and enjoy ourselves. As we walked down the street, I asked, Would you mind telling me what you said in that prayer? He laughed and said, I don't think it is your kind of prayer. Well, I pray something like this. Lord, you gave me this day. 
I didn't ask for it, but I was glad to have it. I did the best I could with it, and you helped me, and I thank you. I made some mistakes. That was when I didn't follow your advice, and I'm sorry about that. Forgive me. But I had some victories and some successes, too, and I'm very grateful for your guidance. But now, Lord, mistakes or successes, victories or defeats, the day is over, and I'm through with it. So I'm giving it back to you. Amen. Well, perhaps that isn't an orthodox prayer, but it certainly proved to be an effective one. He dramatized the finishing of the day, and he set his face to the future, expecting to do better tomorrow. When the day is over, God blacks it out by bringing down the curtain of night. This man cooperated with God's method, and his past mistakes and failures gradually lost their hold on him. He was released from the worries that accumulated from his yesterdays. His anti-worry formula is also described in these words from the Bible. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To help you break the worry habit, here are some practical suggestions you can start using right away. One, say to yourself, worry is a very bad mental habit. I can change any habit with God's help. Two, you can become free of worry by practicing the opposite and stronger habit of faith. With all the strength and perseverance you can command, start practicing faith. Three. How do you practice faith? Here's a good way to begin. First thing every morning before you rise, say out loud, I believe. Four, recite this prayer frequently. I place this day, my life, my loved ones, my work in the Lord's hands. There is no harm in the Lord's hands, only good. Whatever happens, whatever results, if I am in the Lord's hands, it is His will and it is good. Five, practice saying something positive about everything. For example, don't say, this is going to be a terrible day. Instead, affirm, this is going to be a glorious day. Don't say, I'll never be able to do that. Instead, affirm with God's help, I will do that. Six, shoot an injection of faith into all your conversations. A group of people talking pessimistically can infect every person in the group with negative feelings. But by talking up rather than down, you can drive off that depressing atmosphere and make everyone feel hopeful. Seven, one reason you're a worrier is because your mind is literally saturated with thoughts of gloom, defeat, and apprehension. To counteract these, mark every passage in the Bible that speaks of faith, hope, and happiness. Commit each to memory. Say them over and over again until they saturate your subconscious mind. Then the subconscious will return to you what you have given it, namely optimism, not worry. Eight, help others cure the worry habit. In helping another to overcome worry, you get greater power over it within yourself. Nine, Every day of your life, conceive of yourself as living in partnership and companionship with God. If he actually walked by your side, would you be worried and afraid? Well then, say to yourself, he is with me. For most people, happiness is perhaps the most precious commodity in the world, and yet, all too often, it eludes us. In this segment called Create Your Own Happiness, you'll discover why happiness is really a state of mind. 
Once I met a man who absolutely bubbled over with radiant happiness. When I asked him his secret, he said, why, it's just as plain as the nose on your face. When I get up in the morning, I realize I have two choices, either to be happy or unhappy. And what do you think I do? I just choose to be happy, and that's all there is to it. Now, that may seem a superficial response, but I recall that Abraham Lincoln, who nobody could accuse of being superficial, said that people were just about as happy as they made their minds up to be. Perhaps the easiest thing in the world to find is a way of being unhappy. Just choose unhappiness. Go around telling yourself that things aren't going well, that nothing is satisfactory, and you can be quite sure of being unhappy. But say to yourself, things are going nicely, life is good, I choose happiness. And you can be quite sure of having your choice. Children are much more adept at finding happiness than most adults. The adult who can carry the spirit of a child into middle and old age is a kind of genius, for he will preserve the truly happy spirit with which God endows the young. The subtlety of Jesus Christ is remarkable, for he tells us that the way to live in this world is to have a childlike heart and mind. In other words, never get old or dull or jaded in spirit. Don't become super sophisticated. A nine-year-old was asked what makes her happy. She listed her playmates, her school, her church, and her family. That list incorporates all the elements that are important in adult life, too. Your friends and associates, your work, your place of worship, and the home circle where you find love. There you have happiness in a nutshell. And the happiest time of your life is in relation to those factors. Here are a few other things that some boys and girls said made them happy. Street lights reflected on a river, smoke rising from a chimney, the moon in the clouds, red velvet, a swallow flying, water being cut at the bow of a boat, a fast train rushing, a builder's crane lifting something heavy, looking into deep, clear water. There is something of the most sublime element of the universe expressed in these things. To become a happy person, have eyes that see romance in the commonplace, a child's heart, a clean soul, and spiritual simplicity. Unfortunately for many people, unhappiness is their most frequent state of mind. But since a fundamental desire of every human being is for that state of existence called happiness, something should be done about all this misery. So many real problems are created by life itself, difficulties over which we have little or no control. It is simply foolish to further create our own. But the truth is, by our thoughts and attitudes, we distill out of the ingredients of life either happiness or unhappiness for ourselves. We can manufacture unhappiness simply by our thinking. We do this, for example, when we habitually take on negative attitudes, such as, everything is going to turn out badly, or other people are always getting what they don't deserve, or how come I never get what I want. 
unhappiness is further increased when we saturate our minds with resentment, hate, fear, and worry. Well then, if we ourselves create such a large proportion of our unhappiness, how can we produce happiness instead? An incident from one of my railroad journeys may suggest an answer. One morning, a half dozen of us were shaving in the men's lounge. As always in such close quarters after a night on a train, this group of strangers was not disposed to be cheerful. There was little conversation, and that little was mostly mumbled. Then a man came in wearing a broad smile. He greeted us all with a bright good morning, but received rather unenthusiastic grunts in return. As he went about his shaving, he was humming a happy little tune. It got a bit on the nerves of some of the men, and finally one said rather sarcastically, you certainly seem to be happy this morning. Why all the cheer? Yes, the man answered. As a matter of fact, I am happy. I do feel cheerful. Then he added, I make it a habit to be happy. That's all he said. But that simple statement is really quite profound. For happiness depends to an important degree upon the habit of mind we cultivate. The book of Proverbs, that collection of wise sayings, puts it in another way. He that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Out of the happiness habit comes a happy life. And because we can cultivate a habit, we therefore have the power to create our own happiness. To develop the happiness habit, make a mental list of pleasant thoughts and pass them through your mind several times a day. If an unpleasant thought should enter your mind, immediately stop, consciously reject it, and substitute a pleasant thought. Every morning before rising, lie relaxed in bed for a few minutes. Let pictures of each happy experience you expect to have during the day pass across your mind, savor their joy. Such thinking will help cause events to turn out that way. Do not affirm that things will not go well that day. By merely saying that, you can actually help to make it so. You will draw to yourself every factor, large and small, that will contribute to unhappy conditions. As a result, you will find yourself asking, why does everything go badly for me? What's the matter with everything? Tomorrow, try this plan instead. When you rise, say out loud three times this one sentence. This is the day which the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Repeat it in a strong, clear voice with positive tone and emphasis. The statement, of course, is from the Bible, and it is a good cure for unhappiness. While dressing or shaving or getting breakfast, you might also say aloud a few such remarks as, I believe this is going to be a wonderful day. I believe I can successfully handle all the problems that will arise. I feel good physically, mentally, emotionally. I am grateful for all that I have had, for all that I now have, and all that I shall have. Things are not going to fall apart because God is here and he is with me and he will see me through. I thank God for every good thing. If you repeat these phrases and meditate on their meaning, you will change the character of your day by starting off with a positive frame of mind. And yet it is not enough to practice even such important techniques as these unless throughout the day 
You also base your actions upon fundamental principles of happy living. One of the most simple and basic of such principles is that of human love and goodwill. One man who truly knew happiness was a friend of mine named Ralston Young, who was once famous as Red Cap Number 42 in New York City's Grand Central Station. This man carried bags for a living, but his real job was living the spirit of Christ. As he carried a person's suitcase, he tried to share a little Christian fellowship. He carefully watched a customer to see if there was any way he could give them more courage and hope. One day, he was asked to take an elderly lady down to her train. As he wheeled her into an elevator, he noticed there were tears in her eyes. He asked the Lord how he could help her, and the Lord gave him an idea. As he wheeled her off the elevator, he said with a smile, Ma'am, if you don't mind my saying so, that is a mighty pretty hat you're wearing. She looked up at him and said, Why, thank you. And I might add, he said, that sure is a pretty dress you have on. I like it so much. This appealed to her, and despite the fact that she wasn't feeling well, she brightened up and asked, Why in the world did you say those nice things to me? It's very thoughtful of you. Well, he said, I saw how unhappy you were. I saw that you were crying, and I just asked the Lord how I could help you. The Lord said, speak to her about her hat. The dress, he added, was my own idea. When he asked her if she didn't feel well, she told him that she was in constant pain. She asked him, do you by any chance know what it means to be in pain all the time? Ralston had an answer. Yes, ma'am, I do. A long time ago, I lost an eye and it hurt like a hot iron day and night. But she said, you seem to be happy now. How did you do it? By this time, he had her in her seat in the train, and he said, prayer, ma'am, just by prayer. Softly, she asked, does prayer, just prayer, take your pain away? Well, answered Ralston, perhaps it doesn't always take it away. I can't say that it does, but it always helps to overcome it so it doesn't seem like it hurts so much. Just keep on praying, ma'am, and I'll pray for you too. Her tears were dried now, and she looked up at him with a smile, took him by the hand and said, you've done me so much good. A year passed, and one night at the station, a young woman came to see Ralston. She said, I bring you a message from the dead. Before she died, my mother told me to find you and to tell you how much you helped her last year when you took her to the train in her wheelchair. She will always remember you, even in eternity, for you were so kind and loving and understanding. Then the young woman burst into tears and sobbed in her grief. Ralston stood quietly watching her. Then he said, don't cry, Missy, don't cry. You shouldn't cry. Give a prayer of thanksgiving instead. She was surprised by this response and Ralston went on. Why, because many people have become orphans much younger than you. You had your mother a long, long time, and besides, you still have her. You will see her again. She is near to you now, and she always will be near to you. Maybe she is with us right now, the two of us, as we talk. The sobs ended and the tears dried. Ralston's kindness had the same effect on the daughter as it had on the mother. In this huge station with thousands of people passing by, the two of them felt the presence of the Divine One, He who inspired this red cap 
to go around in this way spreading love. As Tolstoy said, where love is, God is. And we might add, where God and love are, there is happiness. So a fundamental principle in creating happiness is just to practice love. In my travels about the country, I have been fortunate to encounter an increasing number of genuinely happy individuals. These are people who have been practicing the kinds of techniques I'm describing to you. Recently, after finishing a lecture, a big, strapping, fine-looking man invited me to a party. Well, I must admit, from the way he described it, it didn't sound at all like my kind of party. I was hesitant, afraid I might cramp everyone's style. So I began to make excuses. Oh, don't worry, he said. This is your kind of party. You'll get the kick of your life out of it. So I went along with my buoyant friend, and he introduced me to a large group of joyous and exuberant people. I looked around for a bar, but there wasn't any. When I remarked that these people must have stopped somewhere before coming here, my host was shocked. Stopped somewhere? Why don't you understand? These people have got the spirit all right, but not the kind of spirit you're thinking of. I'm surprised at you. Don't you realize what makes this crowd happy? It's so simple. They've found God as a living, vital, honest-to-goodness reality. Yes, they've got the spirit all right, but it isn't the kind that you get out of a bottle. They've got the spirit in their hearts. Then I saw what he meant. This wasn't a crowd of pious, stodgy people. Some were leaders of that town, business people, lawyers, doctors, teachers, and a lot of simpler folk besides. And they were having a wonderful time talking about God and doing it in the most natural manner imaginable. They were telling one another about the changes that had occurred in their lives through spiritual power. Those who have the naive notion that you can't laugh and be lighthearted when you're religious should have been in on that party. Well, I left that evening with a Bible verse running through my mind. In him was life and the life was the light of men. That was the light that I saw on the faces of those happy people, an inner light reflected outwardly on their faces, and it came from an effervescent spiritual something that they had taken into themselves. Life means vitality, and these people obviously were getting their vitality from God. Through faith in God and in themselves, they had found the power that creates confidence and happiness. If you want to create a little more happiness in your life, here are a few ideas. One, remember it is primarily your thoughts and attitudes that determine how happy you are. Never allow resentment, hate, fear, or worry to dominate your thoughts. Two, make it a habit to be happy. You can cultivate this habit, so you do have a choice. As the book of Proverbs says, He that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Three, practice happy thinking. Make a mental list of pleasant thoughts and pass them through your mind several times each day. If an unpleasant thought should enter your mind, immediately stop, consciously reject it, and substitute a pleasant one. 4. Each day when you arise, say this one sentence out loud. This is the day which the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it.
We might as well admit it, everyone wants to be liked. William James once said, one of the deepest drives of human nature is the desire to be appreciated. The longing to be liked, to be held in esteem, to be a person whom others seek out is fundamental in all of us. On this side, you'll discover how to enjoy easy, natural, and pleasing relationships with others. How to be somebody you'd like to know. A poll was taken among some high school students asking them what they most desired. By overwhelming majority, the students answered that they wanted to be popular. Older people have this same urge. Indeed, it is doubtful if anyone ever outlives the desire to be highly regarded or to have the affection of friends and associates. The feeling of not being wanted or needed is one of the most devastating of all human emotions. Being needed by others is absolutely necessary for emotional stability and happiness. Yet it is sad to realize how many people suffer from a sense of isolation. I was at a luncheon once when a young doctor rushed in to take his place at the table. He looked frazzled as he sat down with a weary sigh. If only the telephone would stop ringing, he complained. I can't get anywhere because people call me all the time. I wish I could put a silencer on that phone. An elderly doctor at the table spoke up. I know how you feel. I used to feel that way myself. But you should be thankful the phone does ring. Be glad people want and need you. Then he added pathetically, nobody ever calls me anymore. I would like to hear the telephone ring again. Nobody wants me, and nobody needs me. I'm a has-been. The feeling of not being wanted or needed can produce frustration, illness, and even aging. It is not only a sad way to live, but it is damaging to the human psyche. If you're feeling useless, for your own sake, do something about it. Try getting out of yourself for a while. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and find a way instead to provide a service for someone else. Think about people who are less fortunate than you who need help. Volunteer for a worthwhile cause. Not only will you find the esteem we all need, but others will greatly benefit by what you give. It's ironic, but people who deliberately strive to be popular often fail in the attempt. Popularity sought purely for its own sake can be a superficial goal which encourages superficial results. On the other hand, we all know someone who has that extra something, a magnetism that comes from inner confidence. Without even trying, these people never seem to lack for friends. Before we begin talking about ways to improve your relationships, let me warn you that no one, no matter how terrific, is liked by everyone. It's a curious quirk in human nature, but there are certain people with whom we simply don't click. Even the Bible recognizes this fact about human nature, for it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. The Bible is a very realistic book. It knows people, their infinite possibilities, as well as their imperfections. The Bible advised the disciples that they should do their best to get along with the people in the villages they visited. But if they still couldn't do so, after trying sincerely, they were to shake off the very dust of the village from their feet. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet 
for a testimony against him. This is all by way of saying that if you don't achieve perfect popularity with everyone, don't let it bother you too much. Countless people have never mastered the knack of being sought after, and it's not for lack of trying. Some people even go to extremes, acting in a manner they don't really enjoy, all because of their intense desire to be liked. Unfortunately, this desire is often merely a search for a superficial kind of popularity. Having said that, now let me tell you that there are certain procedures which can make you a person that other people like to be with without becoming artificial or putting on an act. You can enjoy satisfactory personal relationships even if you are a difficult person or are by nature shy and retiring. Here are some suggestions. First, try to be a comfortable type of person, the kind that others can be easy with. Some people always keep a barrier between themselves and the world. It's a strain just to be with them. A stiff, unresponsive individual never quite meshes into a group. It's hard to know what they're feeling or how they're going to react. They make you feel a little uneasy. But a comfortable kind of person is easygoing and natural. They have a pleasant, kindly, genial way about them. Being with them is a bit like wearing an old hat or an old pair of shoes. It is important to try to be natural. Someone who is easy to be with usually has a big soul quality about them. Little people, those who are overly concerned about their place or position, are often stiff and easily offended. Although there are many characteristics that contribute to a likable personality, there is one basic trait that surpasses all others. That is a sincere and forthright interest in and love for people. If you're having trouble with relationships, Perhaps you should look for elements in your personality that cause strain when you're with others. Don't automatically assume that other people don't like you because of something wrong with them. Perhaps the trouble is within yourself. Finding and eliminating such problems requires scrupulous honesty and may also involve the help of a professional counselor. The scratchy elements of your personality may be qualities you've acquired over the years. Perhaps you assumed them as a defense, or they may be the result of attitudes developed in your younger days. Regardless of their origin, they can be eliminated. A man once came to us seeking help for problems with personal relationships. He was about 35 years old, and such an appealing-looking man, it seems surprising that people shouldn't like him. Yet he proceeded to outline an unhappy set of circumstances to illustrate his dismal failure with people. I do my best, he said. I've tried to put into practice the rules I've been taught about getting along with people, but I get nowhere with the effort. People just don't like me. After talking with him, the trouble became apparent. His manner of speech conveyed a persistently critical attitude. This attitude was thinly veiled, but still it was there. He had an unattractive way of pursing his lips which indicated a kind of primness or reproof for everybody, as if he felt just a bit superior and disdainful. 
Isn't there some way to change myself so people will like me, he demanded. Isn't there some way I can stop unconsciously rubbing people the wrong way? The young man was decidedly self-centered and egotistical. The person he really liked was himself. Every statement, every attitude was unconsciously measured in terms of how it made him look. He was irritable with people and picked on them in his own mind, though few outward conflicts developed. Inwardly, he was trying to make everyone over to suit himself. Unconsciously, people realized this. In their minds, they erected barriers against him. Since he was being unpleasant to people in his thoughts, it followed that he was less than warm in his behavior. He was polite enough and managed not to be boorish and unpleasant, but people unconsciously felt coolness in him, so they gave him the brush off, and with good reason. For in his mind, he had already brushed them off. In a sense, he liked himself too well, and to build up his self-esteem, he put others down. He was suffering from too much self-love. To change his situation, he had to be taught how to love other people and to forget himself, which was, of course, a complete reversal of his habits. He was bewildered and baffled when his difficulty was outlined to him. But since he was sincere and meant business, he practiced his suggested techniques for developing love of others in place of extreme self-love. It took some fundamental changes to accomplish this goal since his egotism was so deeply ingrained. But in the end, he did succeed. One method I suggested was that he make a list of people he had met during the day, for example, the bus driver or the newsboy. Every night before retiring, he was to mentally picture each person on the list, and as he brought each face up before him, he was to think a kindly thought about that person and then pray for them. Each of us has his own world, people we encounter each day or with whom we do business. This man was instructed to pray for those in his own little world. For example, the first person he saw each morning was the elevator man in his apartment house. Normally, he'd say a perfunctory good morning. Now he took the time to have a little chat he asked the elevator man about his family and about his interests. He found that he had an interesting point of view and some experiences which were quite fascinating. He began to see new values in a person who had previously been a mechanical robot to him. He actually began to like the elevator operator and in turn the elevator operator who had formed a pretty accurate opinion of the young man, began to reverse his views. They established a friendly relationship. So the process went from person to person on his list. One day the young man said, I've found that the world is filled with interesting people, and I never realized it before. When he made that observation, he proved that he was losing himself. And when he did that, as the Bible so wisely tells us, he found himself. In losing himself, he found himself and lots of new friends besides. People began to like him. Learning to pray for other people is a very important step in this process. When you pray for someone, you tend to lift the relationship to a higher level. The best in other people begins to flow out toward you as your best flows toward them. 
In the meeting of the best, in each, a higher understanding is established. Essentially, getting people to like you is merely the other side of liking them. One of the most popular men who lived in the United States in this century was the late Will Rogers, and one of the most characteristic statements he ever made was, I never met a man I didn't like. Now, that may have been a slight exaggeration, but I'm sure Will Rogers didn't think so. That is truly the way he felt about people, and as a result, people opened up to him like flowers to the sun. Another important way to get people to like you is to practice building up their ego. Everyone has a normal desire for feelings of self-importance. If I deflate your ego and therefore your self-importance, I show my lack of respect for you. Though you may laugh it off, I have indeed wounded you. And while you may exercise charity toward me, Unless you are finely developed spiritually, you're not going to like me very much. On the other hand, if I elevate your self-respect and contribute to your feelings of personal worth, I am showing high esteem for your ego. I have helped you to be your best self, and in return, you appreciate my efforts. You are grateful to me. You like me for it. Almost anyone that you help to build up and become a better person will give you his devotion. Build up as many people as you can, but do it sincerely and unselfishly. Do it because you like them and because you recognize their potential. If you do good for people, affection and esteem will flow back to you. Best of all, you will never lack for friends. The basic principles for getting people to like you are simple. Here are 10 practical exercises to help you become someone that you'd like to know. 1. A person's name is very important. When you meet someone, try to remember their name. If you don't, they may feel you're not very interested in them. 2. Be the comfortable sort of person with whom others feel relaxed. Try to make them feel at home with you. Three. Acquire that quality of relaxed, easygoingness so that everyday irritations don't ruffle you. 4. Don't be egotistical. Guard against giving the impression that you know it all. 5. Try to be an interesting person. Cultivate interests to keep your mind alive. People enjoy being with someone who is stimulating. 6. Get those scratchy elements out of your personality. If you suspect there may be bothersome traits you're not aware of, get a friend or perhaps a professional to help you. 7. Attempt to heal the misunderstandings you've had with others. Sincerely drain off your grievances. 8. Practice liking people until it comes naturally to you. 9. Never miss an opportunity to say a word of congratulations upon someone's achievement or express sympathy for their sorrow or disappointment. 10. Strengthen your spiritual life. Then offer strength to others that will help them meet life more effectively. Give strength to people and they will give affection to you. Winston Churchill once wrote about the great British general Tudor. He commanded a division of the British Fifth Army, which faced the powerful German assault in March 1918. The odds were heavily against him, but General Tudor knew how to meet an apparently immovable and undefeatable obstacle. His method was simple. He merely stood and let the obstacle break on him, and he in turn broke the obstacle. Now here is what Churchill said about General Tudor. The impression I had of Tudor was of an iron peg hammered into the frozen ground immovable. 
General Tudor knew how to stand up to an obstacle. Just stand up to it, that's all. Don't whine or complain about it. Don't give way under it. Stand up to it, and it will finally break. You will break it. Something has to break, and it won't be you. It will be the obstacle. People who cringe in front of their challenges not only trip themselves up, but they can often affect a whole team or organization. People like the obstacle man, for example. Here's his story. This obstacle man worked in a large creative organization. He received this name because no matter what suggestion was advanced, his mind instantly latched onto all the possible obstacles in connection with it. One day, the directors of his firm were considering a project which involved considerable expense and some definite hazards, as well as possibilities for success. In a discussion of the venture, the obstacle man would frequently say, just a moment, Let's consider the obstacles involved. Now, present at this meeting was another man who said very little, but who was greatly respected by his colleagues for his ability and achievements. After listening to the obstacle man's litany of objections, he finally asked, why do you constantly emphasize the obstacles in this proposition instead of the possibilities. The obstacle man responded, to be intelligent, one must always be realistic, and it is a fact that there are definite problems with this project. What attitude would you take toward these obstacles, may I ask? The other man unhesitatingly replied, what attitude would I take toward these obstacles? Why, I would just remove them, that's all, and then I would forget them. But, said the obstacle man, that's easier said than done. You say you would remove them and forget them. May I ask if you have any technique for doing this that the rest of us have never discovered? A slow smile came over the face of the other man as he said, Son, I've spent my entire life removing obstacles, and I never saw one yet that couldn't be removed, provided you had enough faith and guts and were willing to work. Since you want to know how it's done, I'll show you. He then reached into his pocket and took a card out of his wallet. He shoved the card across the table and said, there, read that. That's my formula. And don't give me a song and dance about how it won't work either. I know better from experience. The obstacle man picked up the card and with a strange look on his face, read the words to himself. Read them out loud, urged the other man. In a slow, dubious voice, he read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The owner of the card put it back in his wallet and said, I've lived a long time and have faced a lot of difficulties, but there is power in those words, actual power, and with it you can remove any obstacle. He said this with confidence, and everyone knew he meant it. He was, in fact, a remarkable man, who had overcome many odds, and his successful track record spoke for itself. His positive attitude, plus the fact that he was not in any sense holier than thou, made his words convincing to the men around the table. At any rate, there was no more negative talk from the obstacle man or anyone else from then on. The project was put into operation, and despite risks and difficulties, it turned out successfully. Think of the winning mentality that sports champions cultivate. When a game seems to be going against them, 
They can't let discouragement creep in. They can't let negative thoughts dominate, or they will lose the power to win. To be a champion in your own arena, your mental and spiritual resources must be razor sharp with confidence. Now you may say, but you don't know my circumstances. I'm in a different situation than anybody else, and I'm about as far down as a human being can get. Well, if that's true, and you're down as far as you can get, in that case, congratulations, for you're at the bottom, and the bottom is a wonderful place. The only place you can go from the bottom is up. On the other hand, it's hard to say you're in a situation that no one has ever encountered before. There is no such situation. Practically speaking, there are only a few human stories, and they've all been enacted before. This is a fact we must never forget. There are people in this world who have overcome every conceivable difficulty, even the most hopeless, even the one in which you now find yourself. There is always a way out. A wise old man was once asked how he overcame the many difficulties of his life. How do I get through a trouble? Well, first I try to go around it. And if I can't go around it, I try to get under it. And if I can't get under it, I try to go over it. And if I can't go over it, I just plow right through it. Then he added, God and I plow right through it together. One way to help your subconscious become more positive is to eliminate certain expressions of thought and speech, which we'll call the little negatives. These little negatives clutter up the average person's conversation, and while each one is seemingly unimportant in itself, when taken together, they have a total effect of creating a negative mindset. If you analyze your own conversational habits, you may be shocked by what you find. See how often gloomy little statements creep in like, I'm afraid I'll be late, or what if I have a flat tire, or I don't think I can do that, or even I knew it was going to rain. These are little negatives to be sure, and a big thought is, of course, more powerful than a little one. But it should never be forgotten that mighty oaks from little acorns grow. And if a mass of little negatives clutters up your conversation, they're bound to seep into your mind. Soon they accumulate in force, and before you know it, grow into big negatives. Make the decision right now to go to work on your little negatives. Root them out of your thoughts and your conversations. The best way to do this is to say a positive word about everything. When you keep asserting that things are going to work out well, that you can do the job, that you will not have a flat tire, that you will get there on time, you invoke the law of positive effects. You will find that good results do occur. Things do turn out well. Now, as we've said before, our success in overcoming obstacles is greatly influenced by our attitude. In fact, most of our obstacles are actually mental in character. Ah, oh, you may object. My obstacles are not mental. Mine are real. Perhaps so, but your attitude toward them is mental. Attitudes are created by a mental process. And what you think about your obstacles largely determines what you do about them. Take the attitude that you can't remove an obstacle. 
and you won't. But get the idea firmly fixed in your mind that the obstacle is not so great as you previously considered it to be. Hold on to the idea that the obstacle is removable. The very moment you begin to think in this manner, you inaugurate the process that will eventually remove your obstacle. If there's a difficulty which has defeated you for a long time, it's likely that you've told yourself for weeks, months, and even years that there's nothing you can do about it. When you emphasize only your inabilities, your mind gradually concludes that you are indeed incapable. And when your mind is convinced, you're convinced, for as you think, so you are. Armed with a new attitude, now take another look at that obstacle that's been bothering you. You will find that it isn't so formidable as you thought. Say to yourself, the rough is only mental. I think victory, I get victory. Remember that formula. Write it on a piece of paper, put it in your wallet, stick it over the kitchen sink, put it on your dressing table and on your desk, Keep looking at it until its truth permeates your whole mental attitude, until it becomes a positive obsession. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What may seem to be a difficult proposition is hard or easy depending upon how we think about it. Some of America's greatest thinkers tackled this question of attitude, and each came to the same conclusion. Ralph Waldo Emerson believed that the human personality can be touched with divine power, and through this channel, greatness is released. William James pointed out that the most important factor in any undertaking is one's belief about it. And Henry David Thoreau told us that the secret of achievement is to hold a picture of a successful outcome in mind. Over the years, I've frequently received letters from people who discovered just how practical the I don't believe in defeat approach can be. One man wrote to relate his father's story. My father was a traveling salesman, the letter began. Every year he changed the line of goods he would sell and tell my mother that this was the last change. He always said that next year our problems would be over and we would be on Easy Street. But Easy Street never happened and my father was always tense, always afraid of himself, always whistling in the dark. Then one day, a fellow salesman gave father a copy of a little three-sentence prayer. He was told to repeat it just before calling on a customer. Father tried it, and the results were almost miraculous. He sold 85% of all the calls he made the first week, and every week after that, the results were wonderful. Some weeks, his percentage ran as high as 95, and Father had 16 weeks in which he sold every customer he called on. Father gave this prayer to several other salesmen, and in each case, it brought astounding results. Here is the prayer. I believe I am always divinely guided. I believe I will always take the right turn in the road. I believe God will always make a way where there is no way. Obstacles exist, all right. But even if we don't dream them up, most of the time they're not really as difficult as they seem. It's your attitude that counts, your attitude which gives obstacles their power or lack of power. 
To the degree that your attitude shifts from negative to positive, the ability to master your problems will come. You must believe that Almighty God has instilled in you the power to lift yourself out of the rough by keeping your eye firmly fixed on the source of your power. Affirm to yourself that through this power you can do anything you have to do. Believe that this power is taking the tension out of you, that his power is flowing through you. Believe this and a sense of victory will come. There is one simple exercise to practice. Say out loud, I don't believe in defeat. I don't believe in defeat. Continue to affirm that day and night until the idea completely dominates your subconscious. Eventually, you'll discover that the shortest path between you and your goal is a direct one, despite any obstacle in your way. Here you will discover the practical secrets that can lead to a life in which dreams are achieved and expectations are fulfilled. As Dr. Peel says, life cannot deny itself to the person who gives life his all. So, as you listen, keep in mind your most burning desire. Surely there's a way to make it come true. Have you been trained to believe? Are you convinced that you can successfully complete any task you set for yourself? Or are you a doubting Thomas? Do you shrink from even hoping for the things that you would love to accomplish? When you begin something, what do you really expect to happen? If you haven't been doing too well at achieving your goals, perhaps it's time to examine your expectations. It was William James who said, Our belief at the beginning of a doubtful undertaking is the one thing that ensures the successful outcome of the venture. Rule number one, when there's something you want, learn to believe. The Bible teaches a technique for obtaining spiritual power, a method which emphasizes how a person can make something of himself. When released, this power can provide one of the greatest forces in human nature. Belief, positive thinking, Faith in God, faith in other people, faith in yourself, faith in life. This is the essence of the technique. If thou canst believe, it says, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. Believe Believe, believe, so it drives home the truth that faith moves mountains. For those who are serious about getting the best out of life, I will once again suggest that you read the New Testament. Notice the number of times it refers to faith. Select a dozen of the strongest statements about faith, the ones you like the best, then Memorize each one. Let these faith concepts drop into your conscious mind. Say them over and over again, especially just before going to sleep at night. By a process of spiritual osmosis, they will sink from your conscious into your subconscious mind, and in time, they will restructure your basic thought pattern. Believe that you are experiencing this upthrust of force. You will be amazed at the lifting power you will receive. Naturally, in this process of achieving the best, it is important to know where you want to go in life. You can reach your goals and make your dreams come true only if you know what you want. Lots of people get nowhere simply because they don't know where they want to go. They have no clear-cut, precisely defined purpose 
You cannot expect the best if you think aimlessly. I was once consulted by a 26-year-old man who was dissatisfied with his job. He was ambitious to fill a bigger niche in life and wanted to know how to improve his circumstances. In the course of our conversation, I asked him, well, where do you want to go? The young man replied hesitantly, I don't know exactly. I've never given it any thought. I only know that I want to go somewhere other than where I am. Well, what can you do best? What are your strong points, I then asked. I don't know, the man responded. I never thought that over. But what would you like to do if you had your choice? What do you really want to do? I just can't say, came the response. I don't really know what I'd like to do. I never thought it over. Finally, I said, now look here. You want to go somewhere from where you are, but you don't know where you want to go. You don't know what you can do or what you would like to do. You'll have to get your ideas organized before you can expect to start getting anywhere. And that is a failure point with many people. They never get anywhere because they have only a hazy idea of where they want to go and what they want to do. No objective leads to no end. A newspaper editor, an outstanding man in his field, was once asked, how did you get to be editor of this important newspaper? I wanted to be, he said simply. Is that all there is to it? He was asked. You want to be, and so there you are? Well, that may not be all of it, but that was a large part of the process, he explained. I believe that if you want to get somewhere in life, you must make a clear decision about what you want to accomplish. Be sure it is a sound objective, then photograph this goal on your mind and hold it there. Work hard, believe in it, and the thought will become so powerful it will tend to assure its own success. I've found that there's a deep tendency to become what your mind pictures, provided the objective is sound and you hold the mental picture strongly enough. Then the editor pulled a well-worn card from his wallet and said, I repeat this quotation every day of my life. It has become my dominating thought. Here is what the card said. A man who is self-reliant, positive, optimistic, and undertakes his work with the assurance of success magnetizes his condition. He draws to himself the creative powers of the universe. It is indeed a fact that the person who thinks with positive self-reliance and optimism does magnetize his condition, and this releases power to attain a goal. Over and over again, we've seen that what the mind profoundly expects, it tends to receive. Think about that. Perhaps this is because the thing that you expect is what you actually want. Unless you want something deeply enough to create a dynamic atmosphere of positive factors, your desire is likely to elude you. Now here is a great law to meditate upon. Faith, power, works, wonders. Those four words are packed with dynamic and creative force. Hold them in your thoughts. Say them over and over again. Say them until your mind accepts them, until you believe them. Faith, power, works, wonders. You can overcome any obstacle. You can achieve the most tremendous things by faith power. And how do you develop faith power? As I've said before, the answer is to saturate your mind with the great words of the Bible. Spend one hour a day reading the Bible and committing its great passages to memory. 
the change in you and in your experiences will be little short of miraculous. Just one section of the Bible will accomplish this for you. Chapter 11 of Mark contains one of the greatest formulas in the book. It's this, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now why does this passage use the word heart? Because it means that you are not to allow doubt into your subconscious, into the inner essence of you. And this doubt is not the kind of superficial doubt which normal, intelligent questioning raises. Rather, we are instructed to avoid the deep, fundamental doubt that obstructs the flow of faith. Another interesting thing to note about this passage is that we are told, ye shall say to this mountain. The reason great things don't happen to some people is because they aren't specific enough in their application of faith power. In other words, don't address your efforts to the entire mountain range of all your difficulties. Attack one problem at a time. Be specific. If there's something you want, what is the best way to go about getting it? In the first place, ask yourself, should I want it? Test the question very honestly in prayer to be sure you should want it and whether you should have it. If you can answer that question in the affirmative, then ask God for it and don't be backward in asking him. And if God, having more insight, believes that you shouldn't have it, you needn't worry, he won't give it to you. But if it is a right thing, ask him for it specifically. And when you ask, do not allow doubt in your mind. These principles were suggested to one man who perpetually expected the worst in all aspects of his life. He took a negative attitude toward every project or problem he faced and expressed a vigorous disbelief in these principles. In fact, he offered to conduct a test to prove them wrong. Since he was an honest man, he tried them faithfully and even kept a scorecard. After six months, he reported that 85% of his problems had turned out satisfactorily. I am now convinced, he said, although I wouldn't have believed it possible. It seems to be true that if you expect the best, you are given some strange kind of power to create conditions that produce the desired results. From now on, I am changing my mental attitude and shall expect the best, not the worst. My test indicates that this is not a theory, but a realistic way to meet life situations. May I say that I am very interested in you. So every day as you confront the problems of life, I suggest that you affirm as follows. I believe that God gives me power to attain what I really want. Never mention the worst. Never think of it. Drop it out of your consciousness. At least 10 times every day, repeat to yourself, I expect the best, and with God's help, will attain the best. If in the depths of your mind you visualize the best and employ the powers of faith and energy, you will get the best. If with all your heart, that is the secret. If with all your heart, that is to say, if you reach out creatively toward your heart's desire, with your entire personality, your reach will not be in vain. So expect the best. 
Never think of the worst. Drop it out of your thoughts. Let there be no thought in your mind that the worst will happen, for whatever you take into your mind can grow there. So take in only the best. Nurture it. Concentrate on it. Emphasize it. Visualize it. Prayerize it. Surround it with faith. Expect the best at all times and spiritually creative mind power, aided by God power, will produce the best. You have finished listening to these tapes. What have you heard? Simply a series of practical and workable techniques for living a successful life. You have heard a formula of belief and practice which should help you win victory over every defeat. Examples have been given here of people who have believed and who have applied the suggested techniques. But listening is not enough. Now please go back and practice each technique. They have been tested in the laboratory of spiritual and practical experience. When applied, they will work for you, as they have worked for many. We may never meet in person, but through these tapes, I feel we have met. We are friends and partners, so believe and live successfully. Thank you, and best wishes always, Norman Vincent Peale. been listening to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. This has been a Simon & Schuster audio presentation. Recording engineer Ed Valentine, mixing engineer Gary Fink, writer Mary Bruton, executive producer Peg Colm. I'm Connie Goldman.